Number 10, Horned Helmets. The Middle Ages were chaotic times to say the least. There were kings and queens, wars, famine, and no social media to complain about it. Ugh, the worst, I know, right? I don't know how they made it out alive, to be honest. We think we have a pretty good grasp of the past. However, there's a few misconceptions that we still seem to hold on to today. A good example of this is the Vikings. The ironclad warriors who like sailing, raiding villages. You know the ones I'm talking about. For some reason though, in modern depictions, they always have horned helmets. Which simply isn't the case. It might not sound like a big deal to us, but it's kind of like saying the Romans wore KFC hats. It just didn't happen. Number 9, Iron Maiden. Another medieval legend that might have gone over your head, or rather, in many puncture wounds that is, is the Iron Maiden. No, we're not talking about the band here. The very unique interview aid, if you will. Basically, the Iron Maiden was a steel or iron sarcophagus that was shaped like a lady or a maiden. And on the inside was a bunch of pointy spikes that will turn you into ye olde Swiss cheese. While the medieval times were full of unique devices to extract information from heretics, as they were called, uh, this is one invention of more recent centuries and not really medieval times. It's weird because there's already a lot of weird, strange, and brutal machines that would extract information from people in medieval times. So it's kind of weird they came up with this one too. I don't know. It's like a, a fake, but it's also just as... It's very believable. Very believable. Number eight, Jack and the Beanstalk. Maybe you do know Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack made a stupid decision. He ends up with magic beans. He plants the beans. A big stalk grows. He climbs a giant beanstalk and enters the giant's castle, where he steals a golden goose egg. Or at least that's how the variation I know goes. There's actually a whole bunch of different variations, but that's how myths and tales from medieval times go. Myths and tales like Jack often get changed around since they've been around for so long. Sometimes a lot of them are word to mouth, which means you don't always get the most accuracy. You only need to play one game of broken telephone to understand exactly how that concept works. However, I just had to add it to the list as there's some researchers who suggest that the story might even be older than its medieval origins. There is some researchers who think it's 4,000 years old. And it's a variation of another story of another story of another story. Number seven, Beowulf. An old English tale of Germanic origins, or really a weird movie in 2007. I doubt some of you may remember that movie, but, but I do, I remember. I was just a kid then, and I was very confused as to what I was seeing. The CG, unfortunately, has not aged very well. However bad that movie may be, it's based upon an old medieval legend. Beowulf comes to aid the king of the Danes in Hofgar as the evil Grendel has besieged the fair people. He's a bad dude, you gotta stop him, bad guy. After slaying the beast, the mother of Grendel comes for a piece of the action. Naturally, it makes sense. You know, get rid of the son, the mom comes. It makes perfect sense. Beowulf, in true Hollywood fashion, eventually gets her too, which, can you blame him? I mean, you have to get her too. And eventually he becomes king. Now, what's the lesson in this one? Uh, always defend your beer hall from evil beasts? Who dare to stir Miller time? Yeah, sure, I don't want my Miller time disturbed. Or maybe that a 2007 CG movie, there was a lot of uncomfortable nudity. There was, it was really weird, but it wasn't like, it was like just a lot of skin, a little weird skin and like shiny texture. It was strange, trust me. Number six, Lady of the Lake. Have you ever been given that one thing? You know what I'm talking about, that, that one thing that you really, really wanted. For some, maybe it was a bicycle. Others, it could have been a promotion at work. For me and the boys at 3 a.m., it was beans. Anyway, just kidding. That's 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 a joke for the internet. They'll, they'll like that one. Beans. <coughs> oh, coughing. Well, when you were given this thing that you really wanted, did a mysterious woman submerge from the water and rise from its depths and then hand it to you? Probably not, because if that happened, you should be locked up. That's like an insane time level, like hallucination. Anyway. Well, that's what the Lady of the Lake did for King Arthur. Except it wasn't a bike or beans. Uh, it was a sword. Which, in a way, it kind of led to his promotion as king. So, I guess that counts. Sometimes she's depicted as being a helpful lass. and others, she's more of a villain. However, I think Monty Python says it best. <clears throat> Paraphrasing. Strange women lying about in ponds, distributing swords as no basis for a system of government. Supreme executive power derives from a mandate of the masses, not from some farcical aquatic ceremony. You can't expect to wield supreme executive power just because some watery tartar is sold at you. 
what he said. Number five, Fear the Dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently, this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you the school hoodies were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generali were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the middle ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, yeah, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then and only then do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder, go, go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, Dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh, but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more, all moving their bodies with a similar, wacky, frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths, that's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up, it's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was the cults, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure, either way. We're all dancing. Number 10, divorce. Today, divorces can go either which way. Way one, it's a brutal, awful experience for everyone around you. Words are exchanged, property is fought over, and by the end, two lawyers are a couple grand richer, and now the kids get to say dad's house and mom's house. 
Wow, sounds awful. Or it can be a more pleasant experience where both parties mutually agree it's no longer working out, and they do their best to have a peaceful separation on everyone's behalf. <sighs> That's nice, and it does happen sometimes. Well, medieval marriage and divorce looked a lot different. Who would have thought? 800 years ago, who would have thought? The main part of divorce really was just being the annulment of the marriage, assuming it was allowed. Rules change depending on when and where it was. Whereas today, like my long-winded joke at the top of this segment, there's much to consider in a divorce, especially the estate. That's probably the main thing, is, is the stuff. It's all about the stuff. The marriage itself is the least of people's worries today. But back then, it was just about just not being married anymore. I want the bricks in the house. Like, what are you gonna, in medieval times, what are you gonna fight over? Like, I want the cows, the cows is mine. Number nine, off with the head. Another way to solve the issue of divorce and marriage was to get rid of your spouse. The same way Polly Walnuts got rid of Mikey Palmis. Gabish. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Most famously, King Henry VIII dispatched a few of his wives as the church really gave him no other way out of the marriages he found himself in. So, you know, off with the head. However, I think it's important to note that King Henry wasn't the only bloated throne sitter to have his wives dealt with soprano style. Things weren't exactly fair for women back then, or at all. Least of all, the, the law. It didn't have everyone's best interest and justice in mind, especially women. So there was a good chance that if the king didn't like you, you were gone. Happened all over. Number eight, adultery. There you were, standing like a wallflower at your town's clubhouse. Ours was called the Lions Club. You know what I'm talking about, small towns. Wearing a little old thing your sister lent you. Cowboy boots clatter as the music gets quieter. Then a handsome young man wearing jeans all over took you by the hand. Oh, romantic. You've been together ever since. I'm sure I, I literally just nailed that for some people. That's pretty much how they're married now. Except now he's not as charming. Now he's got a beer gut and he farts in his sleep. Ugh. Oh well, that's married life. I'm sure the medieval people went through a very similar process. What am I getting at? Well, when you get married, it means you're with that person forever. That includes the bedroom. Well, kings and queens of yieldy times ignored that rule. Besides the obvious political reasons for marrying, which I'll get to later, what was the point of marrying for love if you're just gonna have 30 mistresses or a secret lover? I would list the kings and queens who partook in this, but it would simply be easier to list those that didn't partake in that. You know what I mean though? What's the point? What's the whole point of doing it if you're just gonna, yes, we'll love you together forever and then, how you doing? It just doesn't make any sense. Number seven, soldier on trial. Things weren't all bad for ladies back in medieval times. Sometimes they were given the benefit of the doubt. Like in medieval France, for example, where if a woman did desire a divorce, there was a non-violent way to get one. She and her husband would meet in front of a group for proceedings regarding their marital prowess in the bedroom. Of course, why else would I be talking about it? Meaning she had to prove that he could not prove himself a man in the bedroom. Happens to a lot of guys. In a nutshell, that means a group of people would handle, grab, stare, and examine a man's gabagool, piche deal, sausage, Woody the Woodpecker, the Olive Branch, the Edmund Fitzgerald, the Ballpark Hot Dog, the Ambassador, the Trombone, the One-Eyed Bob, and the Heat Seeking Trouser Rocket. That's a, <laughs> that's a <laughs> You guys get the point. It was a very embarrassing process, but if he couldn't produce results, results in front of prying eyes, then, well, that means she's leaving. Can you imagine that? Number six, no Irish grandma. In society, we've decided that there are rules and laws and just rules that really just need to be followed in order to have an effective society. Like, no harming others or laws that help keep us safe. However, there's some laws that just don't need to be said. Some rules are self-explanatory, like no diving in shallow water. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't want to hurt yourself. No pooping in public. Of course not. I would never. I promise. And you can't marry your nan. That's right, you can't marry your nan. Yes, that's right. A law from medieval Ireland hits us with a marriage law stating that no man shall marry the wife of his granddad. You see, that's one you didn't have to tell us. We knew that. I knew that. Everybody knew that. Marriage laws were changing at the time because of English rule and a lot of other laws were changing too, but the close family nature of their marriages, well, things got a little confusing. It was just about the time. I'm not allowed to say in I don't think, but it was in that's what it was. So they, they were changing laws, but it was kind of gross. Ugh. I feel, now I feel gross talking about it. Number five, Joan of Arc. Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages. 
Who'd have thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard in my entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France. Number 4. Henry V. Another war? All these people do is kill each other. Does anyone fish? Or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment, Henry V, prologue. Good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card. Just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer, town versus town. Except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh yeah, I play uh, mob football at Oxford. <sighs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number 2. The Printing Press The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Eh, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be or not to be 86 more folios? The alphabetical metal keys would be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink because they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England. One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories, all part of the mystery. What do you think? Genius? Or did the guy have some help? One man in his time plays many parts. Kicking off the list at number 10, boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man, trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, 
water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, and then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. Onto something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five, witchcraft. All the way back in 1542, the UK Parliament passed the Witchcraft Act, which condemned anyone who practiced the art to death. It was repealed five years later, then reinstated with flair in 1562, meaning they added more oomph to it. This led to many women being sentenced to gruesome interrogations, trials, and death punishments such as burning at the stake. How does one know that someone was a witch? Well, point one, they look like one to you. Two, if you threw a hog-tied woman into a pond and she floated, she was a witch. Number three, you're a woman and financially independent. Number four, you're old. Honestly, the list goes on. Anyone could be accused of being a witch. If someone wanted an easy way to get rid of you, they could just whisper in someone's ear that you bewitched them when they were dreaming. Number four, failure to entertain. Today, if a comedian doesn't make us laugh or we don't enjoy a TV show, we just change the channel. But back in medieval times, failure to entertain the king or queen could result in your death. Nicholas Ferial was one of the most 
most famous jesters in history, for instance, known as Tribule. He entertained King Louis XII and Francis I in France during the 1400s. He was born with a smaller head and brain than other children, which affected his neurological and physical appearance. The king seemed to be amused by this, and so he served as his jester. He wasn't academically smart, but boy was he witty. But sometimes his wit took him too far. This got him eventually into trouble, and Francis I decided to have him executed. Why he didn't just fire him and kick him out in the first place, no idea. He must have said something that really towed the line. But everything was extreme back then, keep in mind. But the king asked him, how would he like to die? And Tribule cleverly replied, old age. This broke the king's foul mood because damn, it was a good joke, and had him exiled from the realm instead. But damn, he cut it close. Number three, no more minced pies. This one should make some of our British fans gasp or run for a builder's tea and a minced meat pie to clutch it close to their heart. But rest assured, it was only on one Christmas day that eating minced pies was illegal, and that was on December 25th, 1644. On that year, it was legally mandated because the celebration fell on a legally mandated day of fasting. However, the pies themselves were seen as a symbol of a moral excess of Christmas season. Further legislation was proposed in 1656 to clamp down on an immoral and lush Christmas traditions like and including the mincemeat pie. England was currently under the rule of Oliver Cromwell who was just the worst and he was very religious and just wanted everyone to behave and it was part of his effort to tackle gluttony. But when Charles became king people stopped going after holiday treats and mince pies were safe. Once again. Number two, a beached whale. So, considering poaching was illegal in the king's forest, it only makes sense that they would try to make it the same for the sea. Back then, they really ate everything they could get their hands on, from lamprey to goose to porpoise, and now whale. Whales were seen as a royal fish, and if one washed up on shore, they automatically became the property of the royals in charge. The law was passed by Edward II in 1324 because he just loved whales. He decreed that all whales, sturgeons, dolphins, and porpoises caught within 5k of shore were considered royal fish. Their meat and oil fetched a lot of money at the markets and the rich liked to covet it for their own so it was for selfish reasons that he made this rule. But funny enough, the law has never been repealed and you need to ask Queen Liz for permission to sell it, though I doubt she'd say no. Number one, animal trials. So it turns out that not only were humans punished if they did something illegal, it was also animals as well. In medieval times apparently it was a regular thing to put animals on the stand. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, you name it, absolute crap. Craziness. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Flies! They have no control. They don't even know what they're doing. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation. Needless to say, they weren't well liked. So they were appointed a lawyer and given great dignity in court, though the verdict was obviously not favorable because they couldn't speak for themselves. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil, and to let them go unpunished would give the devil permission to take over human affairs. So they would like literally hang pigs by nooses to punish them. Did the flies actually ever come back? Uh, probably, but at least the humans felt better about it. And I think we can all agree, given the choice, we would much prefer to live right now. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as Traite de Verdun, was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire, and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom, and Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child. This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. 
Shawshank Redemption 2, Medieval Edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's Civil War. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make every shot miss easily. I would just float near the net, tap the ball away. Like, nice try. Mm. Back to prison. Mm. Number eight. Stone masonry. So we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stonemasons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This was like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry. He's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those. What are these? Yeah, they're backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the... I got it, we're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff from growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark. Holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services, especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs who were laborers who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain a good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on, a three day work week? Plant a couple carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, the moss. I ain't gonna come in here and tell you I know what it's like to be a woman or pretend I understand. There's been lots of great photos of humans that have been taken throughout history, but one that we miss for sure is when I was a kid and I learned what happens to women on those special couple days of every month. Not shock, just confusion. 
The look on my face, it was it was priceless. I wish I wish y'all could have seen it. We got things mostly figured out now though, but think about the past. Medieval times, not an understanding time for ladies. There were just no products to help in that scenario. So, have you ever wondered what they did? I did, weird thing to think I guess, but oh well. Moss pads, yeah. Take some moss, you wrap it up in a cloth, bada bing, bada boom, now you're in business. Which actually is really smart when you think about it. I never would have thought of that, but that's, I'm a dude, so I, would, I wouldn't think about that. I just don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think about those big thinking thoughts and things sometimes. I'm just a big dumb guy. Number four, witch hunt. This is also a time where if a woman speaks out of line, or does something to upset the feng shui of things, there's a good chance she will get labeled a witch and burned at the stake. This was becoming an issue because, well, it was becoming a witch hunt, meaning anything that was slightly not cool or basically anything people feared or disliked could be labeled witchcraft, and thus likely an innocent woman would be burned at the stake. I mean, it sounds like they had it down to a science, really. Woman does something crazy, will bring out the charcoal briquettes. No, no, see, that's that's not right. It's not like they could have done this amazing thing called investigate. You know, see if the woman was actually innocent or the claims that she was a witch because she wants to be paid a fair wage like a man. Mm, that really sound like witchcraft to me. Maybe don't be so hasty to bust out the pitch and torches. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Number three, you gotta do what you gotta do. I know what it's like to be down on your luck. Trust me, it sucks. It's not fun. But you budget, save, and work hard. You'll be back in the black before you know it. Women of medieval times got up and went to work. The kind of work a lot of women were forced to do because of circumstances. The oldest profession in the book, selling booty. It's been happening since day one, and it won't be going anywhere soon. Now, I'm not here to condemn that kind of work. And funny enough, in medieval times, it was considered to be an actual profession. I just feel if you're gonna be in that line of work, it should be your choice. I'm a Las Vegas kind of guy. I love gambling, boozing, and the freedom to do what you want after strolling out of a casino after too much drinking and gambling, if you know what I mean. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to make the bread, and they just had to do what they had to do. And that's it. Number two, Hell Hath No Fury. Princess Olga of Kiev was a prime example of Hell Hath No Fury like a woman scorned. Long story short, her husband was torn apart by trees. Some gruesome stuff. It was actually, if you're looking, it's, it's, not, it's not nice. So like the Sith on its worst behavior, she plotted her revenge. When 20 men she deemed were all responsible for her husband's passing were coming into town, she had a large ditch dug where they were buried alive. That is that is so heinous, I, I can't even. She then extended a welcome to more of the men responsible. When they arrived, she invited them to wash up in her bathhouse where she had the doors locked and the place torched. Like it was a witch hunt or something, just had them cooked, just threw, just cooked them up, just, but I mean, they, they burn women, so why not? Why not cook some dudes? Uh, okay. Number one, honestly, who throws a shoe? If you've ever been to a wedding, then you've probably seen the bride throw a bouquet of flowers to waiting bridesmaids and other lucky ladies. Because the lady who catches the flowers is the next woman to be swept off her feet and to be married. Put a ring on it. Kind of ending on a wholesome note here, which is kind of nice, but it's still a, a little messed up. Hear me out. In medieval times, it wasn't flowers. It was shoes. At first, it doesn't seem so bad, right? Shoes. We'll throw some shoes around. Why not? Besides, you know, the, the shoe being thrown too hard. You will not want to catch a loaf or the side of the head, that, that would hurt. I think we forget how filthy our shoes can be. I mean, they walk through everything, dirt, mud, blood, and if you're in medieval times, having a good old fashioned wedding in the village probably meant some manure. Eesh. Well, I'm all about tradition, but maybe we could throw the flowers instead. They just smell better, and you know, there's just, there's less poop. Number 10. The Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like, you're already the first man, you don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay and five on that phone plan. Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I gotta phone H&R Block.
Number nine, The Crusades. A three part mini series spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for the proprietorship over sacred sites and the land in the East Mediterranean. A three part mini series spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred sites and land in the East Mediterranean. Wars that resulted in six million deaths. The Knights Templar, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers horseback bashing their way through the east. These guys were the real deal, almost like the Navy SEALs of their time. We've seen these paintings. The elite fighting force with the red cross painted on their chests. I wonder if they had to do a hell week. These soldiers were the most trained and savage fighters in all the Christian armies. Richard I leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary. It was never like Richard the Clownfish or Henry the Pygmy Goat. No, no, no. We need fear. Way more fear. Number eight, the Magna Carta. The year's 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the law of the land. Did you get all that? Right there. That down. Except women. They don't have laws. And they can't act in place. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? That's right, animals. Being tried. In a court. A lively and popular event trying any law breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathers, were peck the floor, yes or no? Objection, your honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. Number seven, the Battle of Bannockburn. This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. The end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Like, why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like, he's dead. Not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death, aka pestilence, aka the great mortality, or simply known as the plague. Single-handedly the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where bless you comes from. Someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing the mask. I I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food. Should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead, but those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the Black Death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. Chasseur de rats, I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. 
wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him. So he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this, thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, huh, <sighs> fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh, many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey. So if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kind of left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king shitting in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. And this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role, and in doing so, they also gain access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners, so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe, as it were. So. Not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The Gong Farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible. They're not really a thing. They didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The Rat Trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming. So maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey, our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck piles of it just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? 
And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of, eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad, it was all bad. Hashtag all bad. Number 10, playing football. Considering football, soccer for my fellow North Americans, it's basically a religion in England. It's hard to imagine them ever having a world without it. But the football they played back in the day had far less rules and was a lot rougher on the players and the infrastructure. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. So soon, actual brawls of tumbling, angry bodies would muck about with each other. But hey, According to the rules, you had to do everything you could to win. So if that meant punching a guy out or destroying a fruit cart, that's what you did. It also wasn't strictly football. You could use any part of your body. But the game became so damaging that King Edward II had to put a ban on it. It was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment. You'd think he would have just forced people to play by safer rules, not ban it all together, but oh well. It's back now. Number nine, outrageous men's fashion. I finally found the reason as to why men's fashion has plateaued at the suit thing. I sense a colorful change in the wind nowadays though. But the last time they went really outrageous, they ended up getting punished for it. Medieval Europe was one of the most colorful periods of men's fashion to date. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Oh, but that's not all. Oh, no, that's not all. Cod pieces were introduced later on. What is a cod piece, you ask? It was a piece of flair that men used to use to advertise their endowment, as it were. As you can suspect, they got quite big. As did their shoes. The longer the shoes, the richer you appeared, and the more pronounced the cod piece. Well, I think you get the point. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were longer, anyways. But from 1337 onwards, laws were passed to preserve decency. No one was to wear a tunic that did not cover their buttocks or genitals. Offenders were fined 20 shillings, which was around 700 pounds today, or roughly $1,400 Canadian. Number eight, swans. This is actually a thing, and it has been since the 12th century England. It must be kind of weird just partly being born into the royal family, becoming queen and king, and being told, uh, yes, uh, you own all of England, and you own all of the swans. What? Yes, you have to attend the swan upping. What the heck is that? Well, since the 12th century, the English crown has owned all wild mute swans in open water. Over time, they allowed other select individuals to have some swans. These privileged individuals had to mark their bird to distinguish them from royalty a tradition which continues today. The queen only exercises the right over wild, unmarked swans near the Thames. The royal swan upping is when all of the swans on the River Thames are counted, checked for their marks, and then released. The royal swan marker is currently David Parker, and apparently it's one of the queen's favorite things to do. That's adorable. Number seven, medieval masks. Now, to go with laws that make no sense, there are punishments that also make no sense. There is a sweet satisfaction in seeing someone with egg all over their face, I'll admit. Which is why people in the Middle Ages like to serve out punishments that dealt out a good deal of embarrassment. Which is why, for non-violent crimes, people went all out. One comical form of punishment was making criminals wear terrifying masks that were terrifying to look at. They were either paraded around town or placed in the stocks to frighten babies and passerbys. They also made crime-specific badges that you had to wear for the rest of your life. One such badge was a depiction of two huge red tongues, bigger than your hand, which indicated perjury. Good luck getting a date or a job with that one. Number six, Gold's Bridal. And with the theme of odd laws, we continue with some pretty weird punishments. This one also ties into a little one we're gonna talk about later, see if you can guess, don't scroll. The Scold's Bridal was a terrifying looking contraption that was built to punish women who ran their mouths. That's right, it was a crime as a woman to have an opinion or to basically say anything anyone didn't like. They were largely designed to humiliate women who wore them, not to inflict any horrid pain, but there was a little bit. Just the shame though, that was the big thing. The bridles would be strapped on onto the head with bits in the mouth like horses. The bits had spikes, so it did hurt a little, but this would prevent the wearer from speaking. They were expected to parade around in this medieval headwear for 12 hours so that they would learn their lesson. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? 
I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe, good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine, like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop. Let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches, because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only 
bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women. However, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. At number 10, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage, and I'll get to that later. But later in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. On the night of the couple's wedding, they would do the good old brown chicken, brown cow, boom boom pow, <laughs> OMG wow, which could have been a positive or negative experience, depending depending on circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching a live showing of Fifty Shades of Grey. And Joe would be like, yo bet, and then that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that the marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirmed that everything happened. Kinda kinky, kinda weird. Number nine, dowries. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me for that reason alone. But uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate that would be given to the groom once the couple united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. The groom was expected to pay a sum, either in assets or money, to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So really just a marriage pawn. On number eight, shotgun wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back then, then people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alliances, or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number seven, no objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy-nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flush out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama discovered after marriage vows were exchanged caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, Accepted. We will get to that later. For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably. Would saved a lot of heartbreak, hence why the speak now or forever hold your peace was introduced. At number 6, 
Shoes! Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny foo foo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings, and apparently whoever cast it is the next to get married? Well, that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the aisle. Now, this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever, so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number five, Joan of Arc. You might have heard the name, but don't know the story. This one is really cool because she actually existed and she became a legend and a myth. Pretty cool. So the story goes back to medieval times when France and England were at it again. It's a pretty common theme in European history. They fight a lot. However, this time France was losing bad, real bad, to the point where the king of France needed a miracle. Well, little did anyone know that their miracle was in the shape of a teenage peasant girl. Supposedly, she got a message from the heavens saying that she was the savior of France. Well, they let her fight, and not only did she lead with excellence, but she actually turned the tide of the war. That was until a bunch of uh, stinky men thought she was the devil and burned her at the stake for such crimes because you can't let the girls of anything. Why? Wh yeah, because history, man. Number four, dragons. Or wyverns, as they're sometimes called in Western legends. In Western stories and legends, dragons are large, skilled, lizard-like creatures who oftentimes possess the power of fire breath. Nice. Sometimes they're there to challenge our noble knight, guard the tower, or really, they're just a symbol of bad. You don't want to, you want to cross a dragon. However, in Eastern culture and legends, it's the complete opposite. Take China, for example. Dragons in ancient Chinese legends are good, thought to be very good luck and a symbol of the emperor himself. Not, yes, not that one, the Chinese emperor, not, not Palpatine. As much as I like our dragons, I'd much prefer to meet a friendlier one, especially at a Chinese buffet. I haven't been to one of those in a while since you know what happened. I miss that, man. I miss the buffets. Number three, Monkey King. Probably the most famous legend out of medieval China. My first knowledge of the story came from Adam, actually. Uh, he was showing me a video game that was in production based upon this legend. It's pretty cool. Anyway, the story goes that his monkey was born of stone and he gained supernatural powers and he was imprisoned by Buddha for 500 years. His mission was to travel west to where the Buddhist were there living their life as Buddhists do, and he was going for some sweet, sweet revenge. He possesses super strength and he's a masterful warrior. You can see images of the Monkey King and his likefulness at festivals wherever his strength is needed. Number two, Nian, New Year's Eve. For some, it's an exciting night. Personally, I prefer Christmas, but I also like New Year's. I, for one, enjoy a few glasses of cheap champagne and the company of the ones I love the most. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Maybe a few glasses of champagne, actually. Not, not just one, maybe a few. All waiting for the fireworks and loud noises to shout Happy New Year, and then back, back, back to the champagne. Well, ancient China tells a legend of the monster Nian who would scare villagers and force them into their homes. That's when an older gentleman in the village suggested that they should use fireworks and drums to scare off the monster. Hence, he would be there no longer. Well, it worked, and they were able to vanquish the scary beast in all that noise and loud confusion. It's why New Year's and fireworks are such a big deal in the land of the East. Makes a lot of sense, actually. Scare off the demons, scare off the, the bad energy. And number one, this one's really weird. Number one, Chinese Zodiac. Look, I can pretend I'm a spiritual person, I'm, but I'm, I'm just not. I'm not a spiritual guy. The only time I ever feel spiritually attuned is when I eat chicken parm at my favorite restaurant. However, I found this legend of the Chinese Zodiac to be quite interesting. Supposedly, when the Chinese Zodiac signs were being considered, the animals were tasked with a race, so that way the emperor wouldn't have to choose. Kind of like choosing for him. Makes a lot of sense. Supposedly, a rat beat out a cat after jumping off the ox and beating the other animals, and that's why the rat and the cat don't get along. And maybe why the rat doesn't get along with any of the animals for that reason. I, however, think it's related to the bubonic plague, but I could be wrong. Interesting story, none though. Number 10, the kitchen. Now that you've got your appetite, let's talk about the kitchen. Major kitchens of the castle usually had to deal with providing at least two meals for several hundred people every day. As you can imagine, this is where the work would be put in. By a large staff too, usually in the hundreds. 
So you're sweaty from working and surrounded by a bunch of other blokes? Sounds pretty awful. But you didn't take into account the amount of heat. The guidelines on how to make enough food for a two day banquet include the chief cook having to at least have 1,000 cartloads of good dry firewood and a large barn full of coal to keep the fires going. It's spicy in the kitchen, let me tell you. Number nine, the main hall. The idea of a standing army wasn't exactly a thing during the medieval period. So what you would have is your knights or castle soldiers. And unless there was a barracks, the main hall would often convert to have a bunch of cots in it where these soldiers would sleep. It could also be where your guests might stay, and even your servants if you didn't have a room for either of them. And then it became your dining room. It was also your party room, and your courtroom. It was honestly a pretty versatile room. So much room for activity. You could probably imagine the amount of tomfoolery that happened here though. A large group of sweaty men and women after a feast, and they don't have to walk home because they are staying the night. Nice. Number eight, the pooper. The title says unholy, but this room's main purpose is to have a hole. A hole for people to sit their little keisters down on and drop the kids off. Sometimes, down a nice long shaft through the castle that went straight to the cesspit or to the moat. If the moat was a room, I'd probably include it on this list because, yikes. A toilet isn't something you'd actually find in most medieval castles. There are easier places to do your business outside. The garter robe is basically a tiny little closet sized room with a hole in it for this sole purpose. But they were also used for storage, like when you had visitors. You gotta put their coats and cloaks somewhere. Why not next to where Steve is trying to go potty? Number seven, dove coats. You know when you walk down the street and a white colored excrement falls on you from above and you look up? to see a pigeon just looking down on you as if it owns your whole existence? Imagine that, times like two and a half thousand in a circular tower and you've got a dove coat. These structures actually showed off status and wealth as only the lords were legally allowed to have them. Doves and pigeons proved to be an excellent source of food with their meat and eggs. Their feathers were also valuable and yes, even their droppings found use back in the day. Doves even had religious value, being associated with the Holy Spirit. Pigeons, on the other hand, are a menace to society and need to be stopped at all costs. Thank you for listening to my PSA. Gotcha, you little rascal. You were gonna keep watching this video without slapping that like and subscribe button, weren't you? That's fine. I guess you can do that. But gee, we would really all appreciate it if you just gave those buttons a little poke. And then we can poke back with more of these videos. Deal? All right, moving on. Number six, the buttery. I can't believe it's not butter. Well, believe it, sister. This has nothing to do with butter. No, in fact, the name actually comes from beer butts, otherwise known as barrels. The room itself was located pretty close to the main hall, where yeomen would serve beer to the people who were too low in the ladder to be allowed to have wine. And it was usually connected to the beer cellar down below. How is this unholy? Because... I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never done a single holy thing after a few beers. Number five, the bedroom handbook. Like previously said before, when you marry someone, it's for life. You learn to love and you do the bedroom dance with that same person for the rest of your life. For some folks, this was their first time. And as we all know, remember, that can be awkward. <sighs> well, imagine if you had a booklet or an instruction manual on what to do when that time comes, like a Lego manual. Although sometimes even those can be a little confusing. I always have to count the pieces. I get it confused. Well, some churches back in the oldie times were doing such a thing. The Summe Confessorum, as it was known to be called. It detailed exactly on what days were allowed to make the devil's dance possible. By the time all the rules were read and followed, you were boiled down to a small window about once a week, or sometimes none at all. And especially not on Sundays. Ooh, you better not do that on Sunday, man. Ooh, ooh, ooh. that's the wrong time to do it. Never do it on Sunday. Number four, Dragonborn? This is actually kind of cool. So in Viking and Norse weddings, there was a very unique tradition. We'll call it a tradition where the very handsome and brave groom would be tasked with a quest. 
like something right out of Skyrim, actually. The groom was tasked with entering his family tomb and retrieving and or placing a ceremonial blade that acknowledges him tying the knot. Now, is that as cool as fighting off drogers and emptying literally every urn you see in search of gold and amethyst? No, no it's not. However, I can't recommend entering anyone's grave before the invention of modern medicine. It's just not a great idea, but still cool nonetheless, hence it's on the list. Listen, I just got married. Would you own grandpa's tomb? Go grab that knife. Just go in there. Just go grandpa, grandpa died of smallpox. That's okay though. Go in there and grab it. No problem. You come out, <laughs> I got it. And anyway, number three, royal weddings. While poor class citizens did sometimes marry for love and support and to have someone to go through life with as being a woman on her own back then would prove to be quite difficult. Uh, sometimes difficult more than it should have been. Medieval times set a very troubling precedent for those at the top. A lot of times, princes, princesses, kings, queens, and really anyone who held power or land were oftentimes married off to benefit that of a nation or a kingdom from which they came. In a nutshell, these marriages were political agreements, not holy matrimony, if you can call it that. Many times in history, nations swapped sons and daughters in order to save a little skin. Some marriages might go sour over time, but imagine one that you didn't want to be in from the start. Oof. And if you speak up, your whole kingdom might collapse. Yeah, not a good, not a good time, not a good scenario. Number two, witnesses. I've talked about it before, but it still doesn't make it any better or easier. Every person you see walking around today was created by a couple things: two people, a Barry White record, and a little bit of friction. Unless you're a test tube baby, sometimes like you're a clone in Camino, you know what I mean? And Star Wars, you know the, the big tube thing. Anyway, that's life. However, a lot of these moments are private, and they probably should be private, unless you're an exhibitionist or something. That's how you do things. Well, a lot of times for a marriage to become official, established members from your village or community would come and watch you consummate the marriage. Yes, that's right. Mom, dad, the bishop, heck, maybe even the grave digger down the road because he's got an important job. My question is, what do you say when that's happening? Do you cheer? Do you laugh? Do you... Way to go, kid. You, yeah, that's, that, that's my boy. I don't, what do you do? It's so gross and, ah. Close the door, Dad. Number one, divorce by trial. My personal favorite on this list, divorce by trial or divorce by combat. Either or, same thing. It's exactly what it sounds like. What if divorce court had a little less paper signing and a little more club swinging? Sprinkle in a little bit of Hunger Games and bam, boom, you got yourself a medieval divorce. It was a fight until you had to call Dompe the Gravedigger. The wife had a sling and a stone, the man had a club and was stuck in a hole ways deep just to even the odds. May the better, may the better spouse win. Whoever was left alive afterwards, got to be live free and then now they were divorced because the other spouse was no longer breathing. Who would have who thought? Who would have known? That's crazy. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for me today. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe here at Bumblebee. And if you too want to sit in a hole with your arm behind your back and swing a club around, then check out my social somewhere down below. I stream sometimes. Come, come check me out on Instagram and Twitch. It's really fun sometimes. Eating with the rich starts off the countdown at number 10. Medieval recipes depict a large variety of animals being served. Adding to the ones I listed pre Previously are horses, lampreys, cranes, and crows. Hell, even beavers. And let's not forget the animals created by their chefs. One homemade animal was called a cock and trice, and it was actually multiple animals' bodies put together before being roasted. A helmeted cock was another chef creation. It was a roasted chicken wearing a tiny helmet that was sat on the back of a roasted pig because. Why not? Dinner in a show is always fun, so in late medieval Europe, it became fashionable to have an entremetta, which was an entertainment dish. One such example is bakers cooked a pie shell in advance, and then after it cooled, they placed live birds inside the pie and resealed it. When cut at the table, the birds would then all fly out of the pie, much to the amazement of the many banquet guests, assuming that all went accordingly. FIFA fans may want to skip out on this next one, because number nine in our countdown is making football illegal. That's right, while I may be referring to it as primarily soccer in this video, what was still called football at the time was made illegal in the medieval ages. Now there are quite a few reasons for this. Most popularly known is that the sport was extremely different then. It was violent and aggressive, resembling more of a mass brawl with minimal rules. However, it was also because only two years after soccer was banned in 1363, King Edward III would implement a mandatory archery education law. This would ensure his villagers could be used as 
soldier should need be. King Edward believed that soccer, but also sports in general such as handball, football, hockey, and cockfighting were distractions and at that time they could be doing better things. I'm sure there are many of you that would disagree. Next on the countdown is number 8, the future predicting friar. There's a lot to unpack here so I'll just jump right in. English Francican monk Roger Bacon is known through history for his shockingly accurate predictions of the future transportation and life that we have now. Bacon lived from 1214 until 1292 and was the successful creator of the magnifying glass, but he also famously predict future machinery in his book Espetola de Secretis Opribus, if I got that right. Cars can be made so that without animals, people will move unbelievably rapid, and flying machines can be constructed so that a man sits in the midst of a machine, revolving some engines by which artificial wings are made to beat in the air like a flying bird. It's a little nonsensical, but you can see what he's implying. His other predictions included steamships, submarines, diving suits, and telescopes. That's pretty spot on for a guy who lived thousands of years ago. This is the same man who was also said to have sculpted a prophetic head of brass. Apparently having been warned by a spirit that he must listen to whenever the head first spoke, Bacon set his assistant Miles to watch over the sculpture, which he did even past Bacon's demise. It's said that after the friar's death, however, that was the first time it spoke. First saying, time is. Then, time passed. Ignored both times by a confused Miles, the head spoke only once more to say time is past before it exploded into flames. And so the chance to consult the mysterious head was lost when it combust. What do you think of the legendary Bacon and his stories of mysticism? Time is past, as the sculpted head said, so let's be happy we left this weird tradition in the past. In at number 7 in the countdown, it's the medieval animal trials. Under the ruler's power, there was no exception to medieval law. And so it should come as no surprise that even animals could face the brunt of their alleged crimes. This was no casual affair. The rich and the poor gathered for these trials as spectators. Some of the accused animals were even dressed in wigs and gloves, fancy garments to be seen in front of the royal court as their fate was debated by the lawmakers. That should come as no surprise either, seeing as the medieval era wasn't exactly overflowing with entertainment outlets. There are records of at least 85 animal trials that had taken place during medieval slash middle age. And while the most serious offenders were pigs by a landslide, there are records of some roosters and even one donkey facing the judge. What were these animals being charged for, you may be asking? Many times it was the act of attacking or eating humans, as food and grain for animals was so sparse they'd often go hungry. There were also some accused of being heathens or thieves or behaving in lustuous ways. So make sure you have a walking buddy and always look over your shoulder because I guess you never know when an ill-attentioned cow may be creeping up on you. Number 6 in the countdown is the St. Scholastica Day Riot. February 10th of 1355, a group of students who attended Oxford University decide to go into town for a pint at the Swindlestock Tavern. Little did they or anyone else know that this would be the start of a notoriously famous riot. It started with belligerent complaints to the tavern owner about the quality of their drinks and service. As the tavern owner was progressively more berated, he and other patrons lost their temper with these students. The escalation led to a verbal sparring between the students and bar patrons. Both sides ended up arming themselves, but luckily things were quickly interrupted when the mayor stepped in and demanded the arrest of the students who had harassed and assaulted the tavern owner, thus sparking this whole disaster. What should have been a peaceful resolution caused a chain reaction, however. Oxford students rose up in protest of their peers' arrest and swarmed to attack the mayor. News of that quickly spread and the townsfolk revolted immediately. Many of them were already very tired of these students and their entitled complex and had been waiting for the opportunity to rage against them. The riot that occurred ended the lives of 63 students and 30 locals. While the case's investigation led to Oxford winning against the town in court, the Oxford Council was still made to parade shamefully through the village every year on February 10th and they did have to pay a fine to the families of each student lost. Number 5. Keel hauling. Not to be confused with Kegels. Keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and 
everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard, anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach now inside this metal enclosure there's rats which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them the little feet walking around in their skin and this is when the person and still in the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure historically it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside from there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin, and then that, they can obviously bite through. So you can paint the picture in your head, it's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost, just lying there, where somebody is then tied to it, and everybody else just hammers them and beats the out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull and basically it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee, and I hope you are too. Number 10, property. It should be no surprise to anyone watching this today, but women's rights and the treatment of women was not everyone's priority in the medieval ages. Dudes were just mean, I'm sorry. Where did it all stem from? I'm not sure, I'm just a guy with blue eyes, and sometimes I say funny stuff. But what I do know is that women were treated more like men's property, which is, that's, that's, that sucks, that's gross, no one likes that. Which they are not, thank you very much. Sometimes women were traded, like currency for livestock animals, land, and just business dealings in general, because women didn't have a say in the matter. Like, I'll give you two goats for my daughter, here you go, dude, which is just, that's not a fair deal, dude. That's that's not a trade, man. Not a trade. Number nine, promising young woman. Remember when I said if I talk about medieval times, I was gonna bring this up? It's a classic, a medieval staple. Couldn't couldn't talk about medieval times without it, really. What am I getting at? Well, that's marrying a woman in her midlife, about about 12 years old. Yeah, I know, it's gross. Deplorable, despicable, naughty, and just unsavory. Okay, so people only lived to their mid-30s and 40s back then, so time is of the essence. Sure, I get it, but come on, man. I am hereby banning any cradle robbing or diaper sniping. That includes the dudes who out of high school and they're dating a woman still in high school. I'm banning it. That's it. Chetty says no. 
Number eight, bedroom watch party. Okay, let me paint the scene for you. It's 2009, you just finished pre-drinking and watching the latest episode of Jersey Shore with your friends. There's enough hair product in your hair to keep a bowl of lime jello still. You slap on some Uggs and head to the club. You meet someone who's cute AF. Maybe it's the tequila, maybe it's the apple bottom jeans, but you wanna come home with this person. Instead of making it to your bedroom, a bathroom nightclub is now your domain for love. People walk by and witness your actions but you do not care because this is your life and it's 2009 and you can do whatever you want. Okay, so that, but medieval times. Yeah, it's not a nightclub, but people would just come into your bedroom to witness that you went through with it on the marriage. Nobody wants that. That's just weird, that's not normal. Come on in, me and my wife are about to, come on in. Number seven. The Hunger Games. In the not so common case of a woman trying to divorce her husband because, you know, she's most likely not being treated very well and she's just not allowed to divorce and it's really just a messy time for women. How do you lose a woman? You forget to cherish her. Or you fight in combat to determine who wins the divorce. And by winning the divorce, I mean whoever wins lives. Yes, this was something that was actually done in medieval Germany. Basically, there's a little arena. Husband gets put into a hole to make it fair, I guess. There's a sack of rocks and a club, and then you just full send it and start swinging at each other. I feel like most divorces suck. Not that I would know, I've never been married, but I mean, come on, are the married people really telling me at home right now that they wanna swing rocks and clubs at each other? <laughs> I don't think so. Number six, gross. Kangas Khan, maybe the most down bad dude to ever get on a horse and do what he did. Well, maybe except Arthur Morgan, but he's not real, even though I wish that chiseled, handsome, rugged man was. <sighs> Despite my daydreaming fantasies, I'm here to talk about a really bad dude, Kangas Khan, medieval conqueror and womanizer. He had so many wives, who a good portion of which were forced at sword point to be his wife, and husband and wives were not exactly sitting around the couch uh, watching news together back then. They, they did the deed. Whether or not both partners signed off on it. What I'm getting at is he had so many offspring that his DNA is still with us today. 0.5% of the male population on earth are descendants of the Mongol warrior. That's over 60 million dudes. That's just insane, bro. Number five, queen. It is unusual. Most people didn't get to be royal. I mean, think about it, seriously. Although I'd certainly like to be. I can't just imagine it. King of the internet. King of the black hoodie, nice. Or king of the Chinese buffet. My point is that while women in medieval times didn't get the respect that they deserve and every girl does, queens just had it better and that's unusual. The queen might not have been as well respected as the king, but compared to the peasantry, she was fed. Had four walls around her that didn't leak or wind would you know, seep through or blow down and wasn't working herself to the grave every day to provide for a king and queen that didn't think very much about them. That's a really hard life to live. Number four, cooking. Chief, somebody had to do it. Although, there's something that tells me the food wasn't that good. This isn't exactly Gordon Ramsay's five-star cuisine. Beans, cabbage, eggs, onions, bread, and of course, beer or ale to wash it down. The peasantry just didn't have the same access to food like royalty did. Although with a list like that, it sounds like it's a fast track way to an upset stomach or some really grody gas, dude. It was women who would often be preparing those delicious dishes. Besides the hours I would spend on the commode after visiting a commoner's house from eating that, the taste is something we're talking about, I think. When you guys are cooking chicken, for example, what are your favorite recipes, spices, flavors? Let us know in the comments, I'm curious. My favorite chicken is barbecue chicken, brushed with a little Diana sauce. Medieval folks just didn't have that. More upsetting than that is the lack of spices in general. While there were some, anything not local would have been crazy expensive and not available to common folks. Medieval women did the best with what they could when they had it. That's just how it goes, Chief. I talked to him, he's a chef, he said it's all right. Number three, nuns. It makes sense, honestly. Becoming a woman of God, was honestly a good career choice for a woman. For starters, you become a woman of God and that means you're protected under his vision. Thank you, Jeebus. And people need that back then, seriously. Secondly, it would also give you a place to live. Some nuns stayed in one town and others traveled where needed. Staying in monasteries and convents where it was possible and probably more comfortable than living in the mud and stone huts that the serf women were living in. And lastly, they got rulers and sticks and if someone was bad, they would punish them when they misbehave. 
Oh, sorry, sister. I didn't mean to say naughty words in the classroom. I guess you'll have to spank Chetty now. Ooh. All jokes aside, this might have been one of the best things for a woman to be, besides royalty or marrying rich. It's just how the times went. Number two, landowner. I was shocked by this one too, honestly, but yes, women could own land. Sort of. It wasn't a blanket green light. It's a bit more confusing than that. Some could, some couldn't. There was a few rules here and there. They were stupid man patriarch poo poo rules, but rules nonetheless. In Normandy, for example, only men and their sons could possess land ownership. In the Basque region, both sons and daughters could inherit land. In England, both could, but if there were any surviving men or brothers, then they would be considered first, and not women at all sometimes. So, no, it's not as open as today, and you probably would catch some strange looks as a woman rolling up to an empty lot and staking your shovel in the ground. It makes life a lot easier if there aren't so many rules, and I know you guys agree with me at home. The less red tape, the better, right? And be nice to girls, be nice to women. Number one, artists. This one hits home. I think Chris can agree with me on this one. A lot of male artists, writers, and poets get remembered from history, but there was a few decent female ones too. We gotta give them some spotlight. Just It sucks that males get all the spotlight. To me, this makes sense. In my experience, a lot of girls I knew growing up had natural talent for arts. I remember growing up in school and art class was always one of my worst subjects. No, not because I didn't follow directions, but my art never came out the way I wanted it to. I, I didn't feel the motivation, babe. I, I couldn't see the motivation. Most of the girls in art class just passed with flying colors. No pun intended. And for writing, well, besides my dyslexia, if you looked at a paper I wrote in the sixth grade versus a girl from my classroom in the sixth grade, what's the difference? Well, you can actually read hers. I, mine are terrible. All grade school antics aside, notable artists and writers include Clerica, Gouda, that's a cool name, and Hildegard of Bingen. Names you might not know, but for sure are worth a Google search. Number 10, pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage right. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now, the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number nine, beastly justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a night and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand and it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are, but the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. 
I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair, they're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chainmail. You know how heavy chainmail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chainmail. My knees would buckle. No thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five is the legal protection of claiming sanctuary. Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame depicts an iconic scene of Quasimodo swinging around on rope dramatically over the burning base of the Notre. Having just saved Esmeralda from an execution, he holds her aloft in the cathedral's terrace and screams out sanctuary. Sanctuary actually predates Christianity and originates far back into the 300s and existed until the 16th century. Every medieval law folded to the protections of sanctuary no matter the criminal's crime. Now, sanctuary-seeking criminals might have been required to perform penance or go into exile, but they were at least guaranteed immunity from punishment. That's right, you could literally strangle someone and then run to the church to claim sanctuary and no one could come in and harm, arrest, or remove you for punishment. Sanctuary was abolished due to the new tide of judicial law and the arguments of crime, power, and punishment. Also, because people should be punished for, I don't know, maybe taking someone else's life. Originally, before Christianity, it was temples such as the ones in Greek and Rome offering the solace, and it was part of the Roman law by the end of the fourth century to have it. Christianity adopted this practice to try and persuade people to join their religion when it started. Even after the Western Roman Empire fell in 476, churches maintained their authority to protect people who had broken major secular laws. Number four, let's meet the Yellow Ladies. Venice, Italy was an important trading post. Many people came and went, many travelers came to see the great city. But for those who had been at sea for a while, they may have wanted to see a little 
little something else. As a result, medieval Venice was a massive red light district, enjoyed by many before their next voyages. Trying to control the number of ladies working the streets, the Venetian government mandated in 1360 that brothels must be concentrated in the market and port districts. Obviously that just made their industry boom more since it was concentrated right where all the money came in and not dispersed, requiring men to travel farther out in convenient ways. Angry now that they weren't at least getting to capitalize off the potential tax revenue of these women, they in 1420 decided to be accommodative of their lady of the night friends. The Venetian government accommodated more red light districts and implemented safety means within them, as well as the law of yellow. All women of the trade were to wear shades of yellow so as to be identifiable to their clientele, so random ladies just out on a stroll who happen to be in the area don't get harassed. But also it's a little bit of that classic shame tactic of making someone unwanted easily identifiable for discrimination. Number 3 is the indigenous sumptuaries of Spain. As early as 1501, the crown warned natives who carried sword, dagger, or any other weapons that they face confiscation and may be condemned to more punishments according to what the court sees fit. Spanish restrictions against natives developed through the 16th century. This mandate is no surprise as these items, while dangerous, complemented and enhanced men's fashions, and fashionable repairs became integral to everyday masculine attire in Europe. To the indigenous, they had been items of necessity to carry and often seen as symbolic. For indigenous men of the elite, the right to bear arms highlighted much more than their privileged status the way that it did for the colonizer. It demonstrated colonial acknowledgement of their once dominant standing on their original lands and partially vindicated their marginalized reality even as a royal. June 8, 1685, Don Diego Garcia, an indigenous leader of what's now Guerrero, had petitioned to the Viceroy of New Spain to intervene on his behalf when this sumptuary denied him the right his parents, grandparents, and ancestors had always possessed. Garcia was one of 505 petitions submitted by 277 towns between 1575 and 1693 demanding change. In response to a perceived disregard for the law, the monarchy reissued the restriction six more times over the course of the next 70 years. The items requested by Don Diego Garcia reflected both indigenous and European definitions of masculinity. By focusing on European attire and the personal weapons, Garcia took advantage of the social currency imposed by Spanish colonizers. As an elite, Garcia faced decreased political power and increased marginalization under a new regime. Garments and swords provided the ability to visually assert himself in everyday life. Ultimately, petitions submitted by Garcia and his peers reflected not just a request for special status items, but an attempt to assert their belonging as an elite man in a colonial life. Number two is just absurd, but you can club a Swede. If they cross the frozen sea between Denmark and Sweden. What? This unusual law was imposed during the Dano Swedish Wars of 1657 to 58. King Charles Gustav of Sweden had been planning to cross the Orsand by ship, but the freezing temperatures of January changed that plan. Frozen solid, the Swedes realized that they could simply just walk across. This completely caught the Danes off guard as no attack had been predicted until the spring and they scrambled to compensate. Ultimately, the Danes signed the Treaty of Roxgild and yielded to the territory dispute. But ever since that day, should you see a Swede crossing over the frozen sea on foot, you are legally free to swing a big old club at him. And finally, at number one, you either tuck it or you lose it. Medieval Wales was not playing around when it came to women being violated. If you were caught or perpetrator of this heinous crime, your options were to pay a dowry or get the little man chopped off. That's right, a violation such as this was actually considered a theft and was treated as such by the law. Should a perp pay the dowry, then legally the woman's virginity or body was restored in legal parameters. Can't or won't pay the fine? Well then, that was the end of down there for you. The reason for this, other than it being morally right, is that the fines and punishments hope to stop families from developing harmful feuds which would damage the wider society as a whole. This was not exclusive to Wales, however. This punishment shows up in the 1750s code of Constinian Marvodokat in Eastern Europe. It was not unheard of for women to also simply just take the law into their hands either. In a rural area of Shropshire near the Welsh border in 1405, Isabella Grawernus and her two daughters ambushed her attacker in a field, tied him up, and did the dreaded snip snip and stole his horses to boot. All three women were subsequently pardoned. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together at Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were 
too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrews fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet, so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks. Can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird. Go home. Relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's 
knows. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches. Just saying. Number five, garbage stew. Ever walk down the stairs and say, Mom, what's for dinner? And she says, I don't know, but pulls off whatever she's got from the fridge and the pantry and makes a great meal, even though deep down inside, she hasn't been grocery shopping because she got into the wine, but acted as if she had everything under control when she totally didn't. Shout out to all the moms out there who do great work. You're the best. Way to go, moms. Well, that's what medieval garbage stew was, minus the whole mom part. It's a little bit of everything and anything and everything that's left over. Guts, chicken feet, leftover salt, spices, if any were available, livers. You get the point. It's kind of gross, but at some point, after trial and error, you'd probably come up with something delicious, enough garlic and broth, maybe a little bit more kitty. Throw in some sheep, gabagool while you're at it. Why not, you know? Number four, helmeted chicken. Working nine to five is hard. It takes tough people, both blue and white collar folks, with grit to wake up every morning and get the job done for their families. This is true of peasantry in medieval times. It was tough, but someone had to do it. So imagine, if you would, how you would feel after grueling days of work in the fields, defending your farm from foreign invaders and maintaining a family. That's a, that's, that's a lot, of, that's a tall order. After all that, you find out that royalty have been having extravagant dinners and meals and having meat every meal, which is kind of rare for peasants. It wasn't that common. Not only are they having meat, but they're having multiple types of meat at the same dinner and on top of that, they're sowing poultry on top of pigs to make it look like it was a knight in a coat of arms riding into battle. Just like a turducken, because they're bored, and that's that's what a helmeted chicken was. Boredom, Ugh, crazy. People are starving outside, and they're like, we should sew the chicken and the pig together. Number three, humble pie. I'll cut the brass tacks on this one. I've never had venison before, but I hear it's good. I'm willing to try it. I like trying new things then I can say no, you know? However, the entrails of a deer and other wild animals baked into a pie? Uh, that I'm not too sure of, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm thinking about a big greasy chef who's using his bare hands, which most likely haven't been washed, and he's pounding guts into the pie like a jackhammer. The sounds, the smells, and well, it just doesn't taste good in my imagination. However, this one was quite common. It was a very common dish in medieval times. I don't know why, but it was. Can you imagine eating a entrail pie? Oh, that must be awful. Number two, chicken beer. This one's great. You guys are gonna love this one. Beer, the elixir of life. It's how Homer Simpson functions. And honestly, I don't blame him. It makes sports fun and watching reality TV shows when you're forced to, enjoyable. Beer is no modern invention and it's Hoppy roots can be found in ancient times. However, the Middle Ages were no different. There's lots of beer back then, thank God. However, let's take a look at uh, a different recipe, if you will. This one includes raisins, mace, nutmeg, dates, and a boiled chicken beaten like a tough cut of meat. All of these ingredients were then put into a canvas bag and left to steep until fermentation took place. Now doesn't that sound like you just wanna pop the caps of a couple of those bad boys? Boiled chicken beer? <laughs> yes please, more like no thanks. That sounds awful. Boiled chicken beer, god damn. And coming in the number one spot today, we have Lamprey. Wait till the editor pulls up a picture of these bad boys. Hideous, ugly fish with lots of little sharp teeth around a suction cup mouth, perfect for sucking blood. They're blood suckers. While you cover up your wrist, medieval people love these little devils. This was also thought of as a delicacy. King Henry I loved them so much, in fact, well, it actually might have been his undoing. He ate too many of them, apparently. Gross. Stay off the leeches, guys. If anything, stay off the leeches. They're gross. Don't, don't. Mm -mm. No. Number 10. Saving your pee pee. Back in the day, whole families, monasteries, and public meeting places would collect the pee pee deposited in chamber pots throughout the day. Yummy. They would take the amassed forbidden lemonade and either donate it, or if they were feeling enterprising, they could sell the wee wee to the town tanner or fuller. You see, the warm yellow liquid was used for the process of dyeing textiles and in the tanning of hides. Oh, and it was also used for cleaning clothes. Screw the smell of Tide and bounce dryer sheets, I'll take the smell of wetting the bed and grandpa's favorite chair, thank you very much. Urine was also used by physicians at the time to tell the health of their patients. I do this too. You know when it's clear and you feel like you're the most hydrated guy around? It's nice. 
I definitely don't taste it like the physicians back then though, or Saul Goodman in season five of Better Call Saul. I'll stick with apple juice for my favorite yellowish drink, thanks. Number nine, Belladonna, or commonly known as Deadly Nightshade. Now, what would our medieval ancestors be doing with such a lethal ingredient? Well, truth be told, it had a few uses. One of the more strange was for beauty. Belladonna had this strange effect on the pupils. The consumption of belladonna through eye drops or a liquid would result in dilated pupils, which for a long time in Europe was considered to be very beautiful. At least, it was considered beautiful. I don't know if that really is. The trouble, well, it's poison. It's like if you were complimenting me on my summer ready body, except I told you my secret secret was drinking Drano. Mm. To my surprise, however, this is an ingredient you can find today in certain medicines combined with other ingredients. In small doses, it makes it not harmful. I thought it would be fun to talk about all the side effects as fast as I can. Dry mouth, dry skin, inability to sweat, muscle spasms, blurred vision, enlarged pupils, hallucinations, inability to urinate, talk to Adam, convulsions, seizures, coma, acid reflux, fever, rapid heartbeat, gastrointestinal infection, high blood pressure, constipation, and more urination problems. Adam's the guy you need to talk to for that. Number eight, barber for a brain transplant. No, not actually. I don't think they even knew what a brain transplant was, let alone how to perform one. But in the Middle Ages, barbers were not just responsible for cutting your hair and giving monks that lovely bald thing going on top. No, they were also responsible for tending to the wounded after doing battle, taking care of the sick, and all the other medical services that the actual physicians were too good for. It's actually the reason we see those red and white spinning signs outside barbers, because it's symbolic of the bloody rags they would use to show that they could do the bloodletting required of monks in the Middle Ages. These barbers even formed a guild in the 13th century, lasting all the way up to the 18th century. Barbers are talented individuals. No one can cut my hair the way Tony does. Number seven, jesters. If you were to peer your nightshade eyes into a royal court, it might take a second because that stuff ain't good for it, you'll find a few things. First and foremost, you will see a king and his throne, the man who rules it all. Next to him would be a most beautiful queen, the woman who has it all. Hiding in the room upstairs are his mistresses. That's just how it goes. Loyal knights, advisors, cooks, everyone's here, as Mr. Sakurai would say, except for one missing person. Who? Me and, and Adam, the jesters. Oh, uh, hi. Sorry. The jesters, the jokers. Yes, no royal court is the same without the jester. The jester's job was to jest, laugh. He's a ye olde comedian. Now, it might seem like it sucks, especially because, well, they wore strange attire and that hat was supposed to resemble that of an ass's ear or a donkey's ear, depending on what you want to say. But the jester possesses a unique power. No, not the power to fart on command. That's my power. The power to speak freely, or at least more freely than most. This was a time when speaking out against the king could lose your head. The jester could speak about the kings this way because, well, everything he said was taken as a joke. Some advice I think we could all take today. Number six. Everybody drinking. I recently went to go pick up some beers, and I went up to the cashier and I got my debit card out and prepped my ID. The cashier asked me, how do you want to pay? And I handed him my ID, being so accustomed to being confused for a prepubescent younger lad. He looked at me confused and said, nah, you're good bro, and boom, embarrassment. This interaction would never take place back in the medieval times, because literally everyone was able to drink. It was usually the case to drink beer or wine and it was usually the case to drink beer or wine in place of clean water. Now they did have clean water before you all jump on me in the comments, but for when it wasn't on hand, beer and wine was accepted in its place. It was a common part of the medieval diet. I think they convinced themselves of this in the same way I tell myself it's okay to have another one. Well, it's made of greens with water, so that means it's healthy, right? Red wine is good for my heart, so drinking it right out of the bottle is okay, right? No, probably not. Number five, the bedroom trial. So divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually didn't matter where this happened, you had 
had to do it even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether a marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number four, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long, long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding, except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. Yeah. Number three, the veil. As we have determined so far in our list, love wasn't the primary reason for marriage, especially for nobles. So as a result, there were quite a significant amount of arranged marriages. Besides the symbolism of humility and purity, it was also used as a way of disguising the bride entirely. The bride would often be wrapped from head to toe to protect her from evil spirits. This tradition goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. That's one explanation, but during arranged marriages, it was more literally used to hide the face of the bride from the groom. So if he didn't like what he saw after he literally unwrapped the package. Well, too bad, she's yours now. Eventually veils progressed to being much smaller, but the tradition of revealing the bride to the husband to declare ownership remained a tradition, even to this day, kind of, except now it's more romantically idealized. Do you see Priyanka Chopra's awesome veil and that, you know the one. At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic, people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paperwork work side of things. But once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me, but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not least, and this is the most messed up, the Lord's Rite. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place. Like why was it even in place? Someone clearly clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the ceremony, but the Lord's Rite was something even more horrific. The Droit de Seigneur was a feudal right that existed in medieval Europe that gave the Lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your lord had a particular vendetta against you, it wouldn't be surprising. This rite could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village. Even if they didn't want to get married, it was ridiculous. However, late Middle Age and Renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the right of the first knight or a hefty fee. So either you pay for it, or I do it. The Dwight de Seigneur was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. Gross. Number 10. Andrew, is, uh, is this you? What? There is no lighter way to put this. We talked about a court jester or a fool, but did you know that some medieval royal courts had professional farters? Yes, that's people whose sole purpose in life was to fart. 
I'm still trying to figure out how Andrew can fart on command, but these guys did it as a job. These guys would fart their way to being rewarded with houses and lands for their fartscapades. Fartscapades that would include passing their intestinal wind in unique, creative, musical, or amusing ways. <laughs> I wonder, if the, I wonder if the mic picked that up. This quote I found from St. Augustine in City of God says, these talented individuals had, quote unquote, such a command of their bowels that they can break wind continuously at will so as to produce the effect of singing. The most famous of the medieval flatulists, no, that's not a joke, that's actually what they're called, was Roland the Farter from Hemingstone Manor in the county of Suffolk, England. In the 12th century, who could shoot water up to five feet? He could squirt water out of his bum. Well farting. Ready? Want some water? <laughs> <laughs> Number nine, arrange marriages. Today, the marriage industry makes millions every year. Flowers, design, and of course, the bridal dresses. It's a good business, especially once the weather starts to warm up. You got options today, ladies. Sleeves or no sleeves, veil or no veil, and thousands of other dress designs that I simply just don't understand. But the beauty of it all is that you get to marry the man of your dreams. Hi. <laughs> I'm not the man of their dreams, let's be honest. <laughs> or at least the best smelling one in your social circle. Definitely not me. However, for the ladies of the past, they sometimes didn't get to pick their man as her family or royal court would. A lot of marriages, especially on the high ups, were often more of a political move than that of a romantic one. Sure, marrying for an alliance sounds cool, but man, dinner time would be like a blind date every night. That's, that's just super awkward. So like, uh, like where are you from? What's going on? Yeah. Number eight, keys to the city. You know when people say that someone got the keys to the city as a way of saying that person can do whatever they want? Well, that came from the medieval times. You see, back in ye olden times, if you lived in a walled city when nighttime hit, they locked those gates up tight. Don't want some slimy bandits, enemy soldiers, or unwanted flatulists coming and going in the city in the dead of the night. Someone who was particularly well liked or who had done something noteworthy to gain the respect, trust, and admiration of the people would be given a key to the city, giving them the free reign to come and go as they please. We actually still do this, but obviously most cities don't really have walls anymore, so it's more of a symbolic thing like, hey, you're great, have this little key that opens literally nothing. You're welcome. Number seven, graveyards. If you're like me, then you've seen enough zombie movies to know that hanging around a graveyard is the last place you want to be. It's their spawn point, duh. And every time you drive by a graveyard, you think to yourself, some zombie related thoughts, but dare not tell anyone for fear of sounding like a weird guy for talking about zombies rising out of the graves because it's sunny out and that's, that just sounds like a tale from the crypt episode. Well, medieval people didn't have fears of George A. Romero's movies or that weird corpse guy in Tales of the Crypt Keeper, as people like to hang out in the graveyards. Weird, I know. In medieval times, they were just a part of the town. There weren't really a lot of fences or like barriers. Sometimes there would be plays, small festivals, and even shops set up in graveyards since graveyard shops pay no tax. I guess you could say shop till you drop it. <laughs> All bad impressions aside, I'll stay away, especially with the diseases going around back then. Number six, cat burning. Excuse me, yeah, Medieval people just hated cats. A lot of the ye old people thought cats were symbols or allies of the big red with the horns. And yeah, they aren't the most pleasant of animals, but I love my cat. Yeah. Not that one. Unfortunately, in the Middle Age France, it was custom to burn a barrel full of live cats over a burning fire every Midsummer's Eve, as people shrieked with laughter and danced around with glee. French kings often witnessed it and even ceremoniously started the fire. But they did much more than that too, like King Charles IX who threw a live fox onto the fire for added variety. Or in 1648, France's King Louis XIV, then aged just 10, lit the tinder on a large bonfire in central Paris, then watched and danced with glee as a basket of stray cats was lowered into the flames. A man who wrote to his brother about the celebration of coronation of Queen Elizabeth I wrote, Last Saturday, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth was solemnized in the city with mighty bonfires and the burning of a most costly pope carried by four persons in diverse clothing, his belly filled full of live cats who squalled most hideously as soon as they felt the fire. What the hell? Number five, bedchambers. Do I need to say more? 
Actually, yes. See, while the bedchamber was the place where the deed was done, those lucky servants that were allowed to actually stay in this room with their lords and ladies often slept on the floor wrapped in blankets and soaking up the heat of the fireplace. The castle itself usually had a cold dampness about it, which sounds lovely. So there were often tapestries hanging on the walls to counteract this. The servants on the floor thing makes me think of when you had like sleepovers and you had to tiptoe through all your friends sleeping on the ground to leave the room. <laughs> Number four, gatehouses. Now for a place with the least amount of holes. Actually, it, it probably had the most. The gatehouse was probably the most fortified structure in the castle. The holes we have here were for the sole purpose of hurling or shooting projectiles. Some were for traps and obstacles. The gatehouse was a house for the main weak spot of the castle, the front gate. And as such, it had to be the most defendable part of said castle. It was also usually the most lavish and ornate part of the castle. If you're inviting Lord Reginald from across the way to your castle, you want him walking through that front door thinking, hey, this guy could absolutely defend against me, but also he has impeccable taste. Number three, the dungeon. You knew this was gonna be here. Don't pretend to be surprised. Well, guess what? It ain't as common as you might think. And it wasn't always a deep, dank cellar in the bottom of the castle. It actually started off as a prison in the tippy top of the tallest, safest tower. Apparently, keeping people in cells wasn't actually commonplace at first. You probably just, you know. But hey, when they did have dungeons, then yeah, they were pretty grim. They were always put in the coldest, darkest, most moist part of the castle. and. They were usually just prisons. Number two, oubliette. Bouncing off the dungeon is a much smaller dungeon and hey, another hole. Yep, this one is kind of worse than a latrine though. You see, this is a hole that they would actually put people in. Imagine being put in a hole in the ground where it was too small for you to actually sit down with a trap door on top too high to reach. That's an oubliette. The word oubliette is actually from the French word to forget which is what they'd do. They'd put you in this hole and then forget about you to die. Lovely, right? Number one, torture rooms. Here we are. Now, how many of you weirdos came here for this one? This room is separate from the dungeons usually, not always, but it was at least not very far. Still gotta keep your prisoners cold and dark as you make them squeal for the end, right? Wow, that was dark. This was the room where you'd keep all your favorite tools of the pain trade. Stretched, hung by your ankles, fire, tools of all kind. There were trap doors in some torture rooms too that would lead to dungeons or pools of water. Some torture rooms, like those during the Inquisition, had even thicker walls to keep the screams in. <sighs> some of these torture rooms weren't used as often as they think though, as merely having a torture room was enough to get prisoners to give you what you wanted. All right, can we like move on now, please? Okay. Number 10, the dancing plague. It was a normal summer day in 1518 Stroudsburg when all of a sudden patient zero began to twitch and move in a way that was so peculiar. No, this isn't the start of a medieval zombie movie, which actually sounds pretty cool. This was a plague like no other, the dancing plague. A dancing woman shortly began to gather a crowd and more people seemed to strangely dance. More people joined in and then it became the dancing plague, which lasted for days, strangely. Some were taken in for medical treatment for the strange behavior. Today, no one is really sure what happened. Some think it was the devil's work. Scientists today think it could have been a mold-induced psychotic incident, and other people think it could be just classic medieval hysteria. However, I'd like to think it was John Taverner's newest mixtape. Number 9. Rushed Wedding not all marriages back in the medieval times were for political and strategic gain. Some of it was actually for love. And some of it was extremely spontaneous. There wasn't even an official ceremony for a long time. And if you wanted to get married, the two of you just had to both give verbal consent, which is always a good idea. As you can imagine, this meant a lot of people would be getting legally bonded to each other in the streets, at the pubs, and while together in bed. Which... Mm, taking into account that people were considered old enough for marriage at obscenely young ages, they were not really thinking with their brains right then. But hey, life was short and love was fiery. But because of this, it was kind of hard to prove the whole thing. So we came up with a lovely way of confirming the whole situation. Number eight, Splash Zone. Let's get it on. Ooh, 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 babe. Let's get it on. Ooh. 
Man, I love that song. I love the classics. You know, sometimes those moments in life require that special soundtrack. Like when I'm gaming, I love synth pop. When I party, I'm a man enjoy some Drake. How you doing, buddy? And when it's time to get low, I like the official soundtrack of Shrek. <laughs> what can I say? Cinematic masterpiece. That being said, that's all that needs to happen in those intimate moments. For medieval times and in many places around the world, people would have to watch the signing off of the marriage. This included friends, family, local leaders, and maybe some nobility. You know, just to make sure the marriage uh, went through properly. <laughs> Gee, honey, I can't wait to go home and consummate the marriage. I figure if everyone shows up at 8, they can leave by 8.05. Maybe 8.02. Just stay out of the splash zone. Number 7. Men's Fashion by far, one of the best ways to show that you are not one of the lowly plebeians back in medieval times would be your clothes. We've talked about how stripes were the pattern of the devil, but they had some weirder trends back in the Middle Ages. For example, long and pointy shoes were a very big sign of wealth, and the longer and pointier the shoe, the more gold pieces were lining your pocket. Men loved to show off their bodies back then too. But they didn't have BMWs back in the day, so one way a dude could compensate for himself was the aptly named codpiece, which was a pouch attached to the front of a man's pantaloons, perfectly shaped and padded to display their masculinity. It's like that one dad at the beach wearing the Speedo, except maybe a little less nightmare inducing. Number 6. Hairless Nobody wants to go bald, just ask Jada Smith. Medieval times had different thoughts about this, however. Not only was a receding hairline normal, but that was the thing for ladies at the time. You might be thinking it's all about the waist, the legs, or the booty. Well, not back then. So if the forehead is all the rage, focus on it, right? Makes sense. How is this done? Well, you can start by plucking those lashes, don't need those, then pluck the eyebrows, ain't gonna need those either, and just start reeling back that hairline. Oh, perfect, now you're ready for a night on the town. The history of women's fashion and traditions is a story of pain, beauty, and some really weird choices. For number five, we're getting a little spicy with risque's men's clothing. Now, you may have already heard stories or seen memes about ridiculously long pointed shoes and groin flattering armor, but did you know that provocative men's clothing was all the rage for a period of time in the medieval era. It's recorded that in the late 14th century, men were quite keen to be seen in overtly short tunics and thin tights. By 1463, a modesty statute had to be passed as men had upgraded to wearing cod pieces publicly, which did cover their mostly exposed genitals, but only by making them look cartoonishly large and bulbous in the process. A similar escapade happened with the Krakow shoe. These long, pointy-ended shoes were sometimes so long that they had to be tied back around the wearer's ankles or reinforced inside with a whalebone. The same statute in 1463 also addressed limiting these Krakow shoes for those reasons. Seems like there may be a little bit of a compensation theme here. Both provocative dressing and shoe length were limited to those of extreme wealth after the statute passed, but that didn't stop the development of some more outlandish beauty standards. For example, number four in our countdown is Plucked Bear. Nowadays, whether you're scrolling through an app or walking down the road, you're likely to see advertisements for eyelashes and hair accentuation services. And while that may be pretty trendy and normal to us, now, in the medieval ages, having hair on your face would have actually made you stand out in a crowd. Women would remove their eyebrows, eyelashes, even significantly reduce their hairline so as to achieve a smooth egg-like effect. This was because the forehead was considered the center point of the face for many years, and so it would make sense to remove anything on or around it so as to accentuate it, right? Maybe. Moving on. If you're tired of her plucking herself bald, and she's tired of you wearing shoes that enter a room before you do, then maybe it's time for a good old fashioned medieval divorce by combat. That's right, you heard me. Coming in at number three is divorce by combat. This finding was discovered in historic German manuscript that laid out rules as to how divorce by combat was to proceed. Their decision to use combat as a means of to solution was not unusual for medieval Germany, as trial by combat was part of their law system. Trial by combat was legally sanctioned duel that ensured whomever was to win the fight was deemed 
Right. There are many ways that these duels could be fought and various weapons and locations in which to have them. The divorce by combat trial was placed when a man was put into a three foot deep hole with one hand tied behind his back. The woman, however, would have a normal ground and be able to move freely. This was believed to ensure a fair fight between the sexes. Now there is some evidence that the outcome of these trials could still end in death even if the death was not as a result of the combat. It's said that if the man lost to his wife, he would be taken from his hole and executed in the town square. If the woman lost, she would be then placed in the hole and then buried alive. So yeah, I'd say maybe try talking it out a little bit first before resorting to a public throwdown that can end in death. And while we're on the topic of trials, number two on the countdown is trials of the dead. Who would have such a vendetta with the dead that they would have them unburied to stand a trial? Well, new Pope Stephen, that's who. In 897, the months old body of Pope Fomorphia the first pope to ever be executed, was extracted from his grave to serve trial for his alleged usurping of papacy. The new pope donned the corpse in elaborate robes and even assigned a deacon for defense. You may be wondering why the new pope Stephen had done this to his predecessor. Since a holy person's body was considered to become a holy relic in death, it became a holy right to display their corpse in public tombs or churches so petitioners may still visit their former saint to leave tokens or deliver prayer. What better way to to ensure that you have devoted attention of the community, then a postpartum smear campaign where your opponent can't defend themselves because, well, they're dead. Stephen found the deceased Pope from Morpheus guilty so that he could toss his body into the Tiber River, as nobody can venerate his relic if his body is lost at sea. That's a pretty intense way to upsurp the person who had the job before you. Jokes on Stephen, however, as shortly after this trial, he was executed just like his predecessor, making him once again come in in second to Fomorpheus. Call it karma. With that dose of crazy, we can move on to medieval madness, which ranks at number one in our countdown. What was the medieval madness? Well, if you're a fan of rye bread, you may not want to listen in on this. In an era without refrigeration systems, as well as poor hygiene, produce was left to natural elements. As a result, mold and bacteria growth was common and would, of course, migrate into food. Ergot mold is the most well known for its effect on the brain. It caused wild hallucinations and extreme extreme emotional changes as the chemicals in your brain became imbalanced. The consumption of this mold and bacteria has had a variety of exclusively unpleasant side effects, such as vomiting, diarrhea, convulsions, delayed visions, even mania and psychosis. These symptoms make it obvious as to why this could be labeled as a madness. The extreme cases of ergot consumption would of course lead to things such as loss of limb, gangrene, or death. And this connection between molding rye flour and ergot poisoning wouldn't be made until 16 70. So for hundreds of years beforehand, commoners saw ergot poisoning to be things like demonic possession. Many theorize and connect the medieval madness to that of the time periods of the witch trials. The trials began in 1691, a year of intensive wet and cold which produces a higher level of ergot. They ended abruptly in 1693, a year said to be sparse on rye grain. If there's less to consume, there's less ability to be poisoned. Making it arguable that there could be a connection between the two, especially as a side effect of ergot poisoning could be mistaken as demonic possession as previously mentioned. And that is also seen as a symptom of witchcraft. Still, this may not be the kind of bread you want to chase. Number 10, farming. In a world with a lack of food, not because I ate it all, which is honestly a good reason, peasantry had to work on their farms, not only to feed the rich, but also themselves. So if the men in your household are ill or sick, then that means it's rivet rosy time. Or Farming Fran time, whatever you want to call it. I don't need to tell any farmer out there how tough their job can be. Being a medieval woman farmer, that's tough. Also, they probably weren't allowed to wear clothing that was more suitable for plowing fields. And of course, there's a woman trying to do a man's job. How dare she? People just should have let them be. There's a good chance the crops wouldn't make it either. A green thumb would have come in very handy. A tough job nonetheless. Number nine, beer maiden. This one goes out to any woman who's ever had the pleasure of working at a certain restaurant that's fixated on women's chests. You know the one I'm talking about. Or any woman who had the absolute pleasure of working at a golf course clubhouse. Keep your mitts to yourself, you filthy animals. I can't imagine the bar maidens of yieldy times had better luck. There really aren't a lot of laws to protect them either. But basically, they helped serve ale in the taverns and inns, which brought in all kinds of unsavory types. 
Mind you, it's not as bad as it would be in Skyrim or you know other fantasy RPGs, but it's still a sour bunch. Sometimes there were just barrels of ale and the maiden's job was to simply just keep filling the tankards and handing them out. I'm sure she was well respected and not even once ever had her personal space infringed upon, right? Of course not, no. Number eight, caring for children. Hey, someone had to do it. A woman's job is never done. At least that's what my mom, my aunt, uh, my grandma and pretty much every woman I've ever known has always said. Okay, sure, I was a little bit of a handful. I was loud and energetic and, and I loved to talk. Teachers always said I was a distraction in class. All right, maybe I was, and maybe I still am. Okay, I am. But at least the women caring for me had the modern amenities of the 21st century. A fridge full of fresh food, washing machines, cars, and a solid structure with four walls. So you can imagine if you had to deal with a kid like me back in ye olde times, just with none of the nice stuff that makes life today a lot of fun. Ye olde Chetty running amok. Oh, mother, mother. Number seven, the streets. Unusual to most, but very common to women of ye olde times. When you're a woman who's got nothing, sometimes you gotta give something. That something just so happens to be what's hiding in your pants. It's a profession that's as old as time, and it will not be going anywhere anytime soon. Women work the streets. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. Number six, Joan of Arc. It doesn't get more unusual than the savior of France. England and France were having a go at it if you will, which if you know history was like round 12 of 100. Anyway, it wasn't going too well for France, it was going rather poor actually. The same kind of poor I got on my report cards under the paying attention section. Oops. Then there was Joan, really a, a nobody, when one day she heard the voice from a higher power that she was to drive the English out of France. Naturally, the people around her, especially the men, scoffed at the thought of a young woman being the hero they needed. But given that they had nothing to lose, suited her up and sent her out. Plot twist, she did very well, like crazy good. The Battle of Orléans proving her grit. The English were so confused and disgruntled by a young peasant girl defeating their armies, they thought it was only proof of one thing, that she wasn't a sign of God, but rather a sign of the devil. How dare a woman beat us in, that's man stuff, you can't do that. At number five, beavers. Remember a little while ago when I mentioned the medieval practices of Lent and how they ate dolphins because they thought they were fish? Well, we have another animal that is most definitely not a fish, but medieval people believed that it was. Beavers. Yeah, beavers. They thought that because beavers were such good swimmers that they just had to be some kind of fish and were therefore suitable to eat during Lent. Originally, it was just the tail of the beaver that was suitable for Lent because it was considered cold, but later on they figured that the whole animal was good to eat because again, they thought it was a fish. I can't really see how they looked at this furry animal and thought to themselves, ah yes, a fine sea dwelling fish. But hey, these people believed in witches, unicorns, and regularly put animals like pigs and donkeys on trial, so there you go. At number four, singing chicken. Continuing on with another insanely weird food from the medieval age, we have one that was pretty dangerous to eat, though the people who lived back then probably didn't know it was so unsafe. Back then, some chefs would prepare a pretty theatrical dish and called it singing chicken. Man, the things that they did to these poor chickens. Anyways, singing chicken was prepared by taking the chicken's neck and tying it with quicksilver and sulfur, and when the bird was heated, it made a sound like it was singing. Why this was necessary? Who the heck knows? There were other versions of these kinds of theatrical meals as well, where swans, pigs, and even fish were made to look like it was breathing fire. Chefs would soak cotton in alcohol and place it inside the animal, and when it was time to serve, they would light the cotton on fire and make the food look like it was some kind of dragon. At number three, roasted swan. A lot of people see swans as beautiful creatures. I mean, I see them as deceptive geese because even though they are pretty, they will still attack you and eat your young, but I digress. Though swans are a lot of people's favorite animals, in medieval times, swans were more so people's favorite food. Yeah, even the swans weren't safe from being devoured. Now, some of you might think, oh, well, since it's a bird, it's probably prepared in a normal way. And to those people, I say, have you been paying attention at all? Nothing was normal back then, and of course they had to make things weird. There were two ways of preparing a swan. The weird way, and the strange way. The first way of preparing the swan was to mince the entrails of a boiled swan with bread, ginger, and blood, and then mix it with vinegar. Yum. And the second way was to cut the bird open, remove its skin, roast it on a spit, and then reclothe it with its skin and feathers, and present it to eager guests. 
sounds absolutely horrible. On number two, lamprey. Imagine this, a gross, slithery eel with gray scaly skin and a suction cup-like face full of tiny, sharp teeth. Does that sound tasty to you? Because I can't say it does. However, to people in the medieval age, apparently it was finger licking good because this lamprey was all the rage and was actually a favorite of King Henry I of England who was actually said to have died from eating too many lamprey. Lamprey was considered a delicacy and was often enjoyed with a side of hot sauce. I don't care how it's prepared, you cannot catch me eating a sharp tooth worm of the sea. And finally at number one, live food. I think that by now we understand that medieval cuisine was as much about theatrics as it was about sustenance. Between singing chickens, fire breathing fish, and cock and trices, a lot was happening in the kitchens back then, but by far the weirdest food trend from the medieval age was their live food shows. Because a lot of people loved a good show, chefs came up with a new idea to wow their dinner guests where they would serve an animal that looked to be dead and cooked, only for it to get up and run away when it got to the table. The most common animal used for these theatrics was of course the chicken. To prepare this unorthodox dish, the chef would take the animal, let's use the chicken as an example, and they would pluck it while it was still alive and glaze it to make it look like it had been cooked. They would then wait until the chicken fell asleep in the kitchen and bring it out on a platter. However, just as the chicken was about to be carved up and served, it would wake up and run down the table creating a chaotic dinner. Another common live food that would be served was frog pie. Chefs would put frogs in a pie and then when the top of the pie was cut open, the frogs would jump out and startle the dinner guests. Now how's that for dinner and a show? Slander is number 10. Imagine seeing some random dude in the market square holding his nose and shouting about how he was a liar. Honestly, wasn't weird under the Norman law from 1066 to 1154. If you committed the act of slander, on top of paying damages to those whose reputation you may have affected, you also had to do the holding of the nose. This law was enacted by Pouty, first king of Norman, who had spent his whole life on the throne being called William the Bastard for his parents' unmarried status. In return, he exacted this silly law that required the slanderer to stand in the center of town as previously described, holding their nose and shouting about their lies. Public humiliation has long since been an effective means of preventing crime. And just about anything. Number 9 is Jenny cragging it. Edward III of England was so tired of his royal court and nobility being heavier set that he made an entire law about it. In 1336, the new law stated obesity made people not able to aid themselves nor their liege lord in times of need. Edward mandated a maximum belt size and also, if you watched part one, implemented food restrictions, banning more than two courses with the exception of holy days. Edward even defined soup as a separate course to prevent people from calling that a sauce or a condiment. This law lasted remarkably until 1856. Its main purpose in the long run had likely become beneficial economically to ensure that England's resources could be employed more effectively in the upcoming war with the French. Still, regardless, he seems like a fat shaming dude. German people Purity law is number 8. Beer is Germany's national drink, and that's nothing new. The Germans have been indulging for thousands of years. Typically, beer was produced in groups and always made of pure grain, until the purity laws made by Wilhelm IV in 1516 Bavaria. Germans, and most people of the medieval and middle ages, didn't drink water as it was often deeply contaminated. They drank beer. The law imposed was aimed at preventing crops used to make bread from being squandered on brewing, so it stipulates that only water, bar barley, and hops were allowed to be used as key ingredients for beer production. At first, brewers thought this was ludicrous and unusual to decide, but turns out Wilhelm was actually onto something with this combination. This original law went on to become the core of German beer purity laws that affect German brewing to this day, which makes them the oldest regulations related to food and drink in the world. The only change to it in recent history was the adding of yeast. The Brewers Association of Germany wants the 5th century old law governing how German beer is made to become part of the UNESCO World Heritage List. It would join the Argentinian tango, Iranian carpet weaving, and French gastronomy, among other famous traditions that are considered unique and worth protecting. Let's talk sumptuary laws with the Spanish garment laws, number 7 in the countdown. Sumptuary laws, which we discussed in part 1, are placed in to control the nobility and their consumption and displays of material goods. In the case of Spain, there are many sumptuary laws in place as early as the Spartan era. 
era. In the 13th century, for example, Siena passed a provision reducing the trains on women's dresses, which was a direct effort to curb a purely aristocratic style. In 1356, the city of Florence proclaimed it illegal for women to have buttons on their clothing without a corresponding buttonhole. And also, no one other than the king was illegally permitted to wear a scarlet rain cape. Also in Florence, it was studied how sumptuary legislation around fashion served as a tool to encourage marriage in a society where excessive extravagance of men providing clothing for the women and their families exasperated the custom of very expensive dowries. If her standards were already up, you had to work harder to pay for her, I guess. And a delay in marriage did mean a dip in population. While there are ample examples of the laws themselves, similar to many other sumptuary laws, there's virtually no record of their enforcements or punishments. Oftentimes, this is because nobility themselves violated their own laws that they made for themselves. Without evidence of how exactly these laws were enforced or whether they were enforced at all, it remains extremely difficult to discuss their social impact, the attitude civilians had towards them as well. Did they act accordingly so as not to face legal difficulties or the payment of fines? Who knows? Not us. So on to the next. Refusing knighthood comes in at number six. This law was put into place in 1233. Why, you may ask? Because simply put, being a knight sucked. If you saw our last video, you may remember hearing about how insanely taxed knights were, but on top of that, you had to pay for a ton of mandatory clothes, train incessantly, pay the king for serving him, and don't forget the custom sized armor. You lose or gain weight, you're gonna have to pay to replace whole pieces. That's on top of the potential of dying in a battle you just don't care for. No, not many people wanted to be a knight. Roger of Dudley refused to attend his own knighting when he learned he'd have to pay for it. In response to his refusal, Henry III on the spot passed a law against refusing the knighthood. He forcefully knighted Dudley and also confiscated his land to boot. Yikes. Number five, castles. Besides a knight in shining armor, what's the first thing you think of when you think of medieval times? Castles, yeah, obviously. Yes, I'm talking about castles, but bear with me here, just hear me out. Okay, so when we were kids, we all wanted to live in a huge mansion, right? I mean, who doesn't? I wouldn't, though, because, well, it would be a pain in the neck to clean. As you grow up, you start thinking about weird things like that. It would be really difficult to clean. But it's a common wish, nonetheless. Well, castles basically are medieval mansions, except with a little twist. These Castles are also designed with military strategy in mind. So imagine, if you will, you have a world where your parents have a mansion, uh, but they had to add guard towers and an armory and a battalion of soldiers just in case the next kingdom over gets a, a little too frisky. The positioning of the castle was also very important too. Some built by the coast on top of hills and even some inside of mountains all in the name of protection. To me, that's like some purge level reality where wealthy homes have to be built with defenses in mind. It's kind of messed up. Number four, fair. Punishments for crime in the Middle Ages were different from they are today. Capital punishment happens now still, like it did then, but we don't really put people into exile so much anymore. Unless you count the prison system, but th that's another conversation altogether. Back in medieval Ireland though, someone who de-lifed someone else and was judged to be guilty was given to the deceased's family as their unwilling servant. That is, if they failed to pay the oodles of money required to buy their freedom. As we know, people who were forced into manual labor were not treated too nicely. And they were pretty much had no rights at all, being seen as property more than an individual. This means that the family that now owns said person could do whatever they wanted with them. Their life was basically forfeit. Now, if the person who ended the life of one of your beloved family members was now given to you to do whatever you wanted with them, what would you do? Yes, yes, me too, mm -hmm. probably. It seems fair to me. Leave the punishment to those who are most affected by the crime. Number three, Shark Week. Aunt Flo, she shows up sometimes during those delightful few days that ladies have. I hear you, I know. I'm not a lady, I don't know why I said that. I'm just trying to relate to the audience. But have you ever wondered how things were dealt with before the modern world of feminine hygiene products? Today, you got options, but back then, well, they didn't really exist. Ladies had to come up with methods, and honestly, the beginnings of what the products would eventually evolve into. A lot of times, it was extra cloth or rags were used, perhaps where the expression on the rag may have come from. Mm -hmm. Now, I have no issue talking about this because it's natural. It's a part of life. I'm a grown-up, dude. The tradition of this point is in the tradition of hiding it or being ashamed. That's what started in medieval times, too, unfortunately. And sadly, it's carried over to today just a little bit. Some even consider cramps to be a punishment for Eve's original sin back back then, which is just so stupid. Things have gotten a little better, but I, I think you can all agree with me, ladies. It's time for everyone else to grow up a little bit. A number two, trick or treat, it's Christmas. What? <laughs> 
sorry. In Northern Europe and Scandinavian countries, Yule time meant adopting the tradition we are familiar with from modern Halloween. Dressing up like your favorite spooky characters, or what it is now, trying to one up your friends with the hottest insert occupation here costume you can. They didn't dress up as sexy cats or nurses though. But from the day of Christmas to the twelfth night, young men would dress up according to, quote unquote, the old fashion of the devil, and go around in the night scaring people in the streets. These young spunky lads would go about as ghosts, trolls, or other strange creatures. And in the 16th and 17th century, some men would even dress as the Yule Goat, terrifying children and coming into people's houses demanding cake or cheese, then pleasantly thanking them if he received something, or whacking them with a stick if he didn't. Then the goat would just hop on out of there like this. That was too good. Thanks, man. Number one, Lord's Right. This one is just so messed up. Okay, so back in the medieval times, imagine if you will that you've just been married to a beautiful woman. Just finished walking down the aisle when the local lord of the land makes a surprise appearance at your wedding. At first you bow and welcome his lordship. That's when he grabs your blushing bride to be and looks at you with the snobbiest look a royal could and says, sorry bud, lord's right, gotta take her for a test drive to make sure everything's great. Yes, that's right, there was a law, or a code, if you will, that allowed lords to entertain wives for a few hours. Or like a few seconds. You must also imagine this is a time when speaking out against lords for doing so would not have bode well for you or your wife, so let's just go along with the plan. Number 10, Hedgehog. I bet all the things you thought people ate back then, you weren't expecting Hedgehog. I know I wasn't. This is medieval times, however, and sometimes food ran short. Sometimes you gotta do things you wouldn't normally do, and that includes eating a poor hedgehog. It starts by ending the life of a porcupine or hedgehog via the neck. Ooh, gross. Singeing all of those protective spy needles, gutting the poor little guy where it was then boiled so it would naturally unravel because you know they're always rolled up. Uh, alternatively, you could bake them in clay for that Hannibal experience. Sonic be nimble, Sonic be quick, but that quick enough to avoid our appetites. It's kind of sick. I don't know, I couldn't think of a rhyme there. It's just gross. People eating hedgehogs, man, come on. Number nine, kitty. Honestly, I was a little surprised by this one. No, not because it is a cat. Obviously, in Western society like ours, kitties are pets, and they're just decent animals. I can accept that other cultures, and in the past, Folks were different, it's what they do, there's nothing wrong with that. However, cats kind of have an interesting history. A lot of times, they're associated with bad luck or misfortune. And not just black cats, but cats in general. Medieval times were weird. So I'm surprised that they would even try and eat one. According to one medieval recipe, it involves removing the head because that's not for eating. Obviously, should have known that. It was thought that the cat brains could make you lose your judgment. I'd argue at that point we'd already lost our judgment, but okay. The next step is simple. You bury it in the ground for a night because that's what you do, and then you boil it in a broth with garlic. Uh, I love garlic and broth just as much as the next guy. I just, I don't know if that's the recipe I'd be going for. Oh man, I'm getting sick already. Number eight, beavers. Nice beaver. Thanks, I just had it stuffed. Huh, naked gun anybody, huh, no? I love Leslie Nielsen movies, what can I say? One day folks, I promise I'll be there. Speaking of Canadian icons, beavers. It's my national animal and if you end up on fairgrounds, you can almost bet you will find a vendor selling fried beaver tails. The northern states will know what I'm talking about, but for the southern and western states who for sure eat this but have a different name for it, it's, it's fried dough, it's not actually an actual beaver tail. Beaver tails are delicious, especially with a Nutella spread. Oh, that's my favorite. The hot Nutella, it's beautiful. However, in medieval times, beavers were quite popular. It makes more sense than you think. They were already valuable for their furs, and apparently, well, they were sought after for the round boys. You know what I'm talking about? <coughs> Cough here. The trend of gotta do what you gotta do is gonna come up a lot on this list. That's just kinda how things go. There's an animal, you're gonna eat it. Just, that's it. Number seven, roasted swan. This one is supposed to be a delicacy. Roasted swan. You just go to the park and see those swans floating in the pond, and you think to yourself, yeah, I'd like to roast and eat those birds. Kind of a weird thing to think, but okay, sure. I know swans can be aggressive, but damn, okay. Anyway, more disturbing than daydreaming about eating unusual poultry is what medieval people did to prepare swans. One recipe calls for its guts and vinegar to be used in bread making. I think we'll skip on that one. And another one where the skin is removed, roasted, and then the skin and feathers put back on the bird, so you put it back on the dinner table for like a show and then peel it back off. It's just, it's strange. I feel like that's not very sanitary. I feel like the feathers are the dirtiest part. You 
you always have to remove the feathers, don't you, Chris? I don't know. It's weird. Number six, sheep's business. When you've trimmed all the meat and you're staring at an animal's piece of deal, there's only one thing left to do. Wash it, clean it, stuff it with 10 eggs, milk, fat, and roast it with ginger and cinnamon. Sounds yummy, honestly. I just wish it was a better, you know, cut of meat and not the sheep's meat. Like I said, it's a case of you gotta do what you gotta do. I know today there are some dishes involving the undercarriage of bulls, and I hear it's good, but uh, you can't blame me if a tad skeptical. So that one was all about a sheep's is, is gabagool, you know, his, uh, his wiener von schnitzel miner. Number five, animal court. Oh, did you think the courtroom was a place only for members of the human species? <laughs> Au contraire. In fact, all kinds of members of the animal kingdom, from insects to dolphins, would stand trial if they were believed to be guilty of crimes. Some animals were executed, some received strongly worded letters, and some were even proven not guilty. A rooster was once given the verdict of guilty for laying eggs. Truly the most unnatural of crimes. Pigs were usually the ones who got the most amount of court time, with one account even having a pig dressed in a waistcoat, gloves, pants, and a human mask to meet his end. I wonder if these animals were judged by a jury of their peers. Hmm. Number four, bloodletting. Look, we all know that a lot of men in their mid-40s treat their bodies like a rusted out Chevy Tahoe. I'm one and the same. Yeah, it needs a lot of work, but dad got an oil change, so that makes it all that makes it all better. This was common back in medieval times. A simple fix or a one fix fits all for every health issue was, of course, bloodletting. The old drain you of your precious life juice so you can get a detox, bro. Look, at first glance, yeah, it makes sense. If my Chevy runs a wee bit bow after an oil change, then why not? It makes sense. Well, the truth is, there really isn't any new blood going in, so it's not so much as an oil change as it is so much just draining you of your energy, bro. Did it really work? Ah, not really. Arguably, it made things worse. This was also a treatment to make your skin pale, and uh, as my previous point with the ladies, that was also seen as beautiful, so remember that. Go to blood clinic. Please don't drain your blood to look prettier. Number three, Feast of Fools. Before the church took the fun of going overboard out of pretty much everything, every January 1st in France, the whole social hierarchy got topsy-turvy with the Feast of Fools. No, this was not a festival promoting fool-related cannibalism. Instead, the highest respected religious officials swapped with the lowest, and serving maids became masters with a king of misrule being crowned. The event was meant to display the biblical phrase, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, which is a creative excuse for parades, comic performances, costumes, cross-dressing, song, and naturally, way too much drinking. But like I said, thanks to the rowdy merrymaking and obscenities, the church was forced to ban it. Sad. Number two, funeral rites. Medieval times, people were dropping like flies, just how things went. So, when it was time to deliver folks to their final resting place, some traditions were in order. For those that couldn't shake the Black Plague, they were put into big holes with the rest of the poor devils who couldn't also. Loved ones were taken care of with, well, great care and respect, and others, well, they had uh, modifications made to their graves. Like, for instance, if you were suspected of being a vampire, well, you'd be buried with a giant boulder on top of you, just in case. You don't know. Maybe you decide to wake up and come back to town for a midnight snack. Gotta be careful. Some were buried without heads. Uh, the list goes on. All I can say is keep your garlic close, your wooden stakes, and 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 just always wash your hands, especially when handling the recently deceased. That's you gotta get. Number one, duke it out. Couples in medieval Germany had an interesting way of figuring out their differences. Rather than just arguing like any normal couple, they took it to the octagon. Honestly, yeah, let's bring it back. Trial by single combat was a popular way to solve disagreements, and when man and wife were fighting, they had some great rules that had to be implemented. As one example, the husband had to stand in a hole with a hand behind his back while his wife got to run around with a sack filled with rocks. Seems a bit unfair, but hey, to each their own. I just imagine every time I have an argument with a girlfriend, and right in the middle of it, we just stop like, okay, I've had enough. We're settling this with our fisticuffs. Consult the marital duel rule book and have at thee, foul beast. On number 10, roast hedgehog. 
Hedgehogs, am I right? They're cute little spiky balls of fun and they make pretty good pets too. They're so cute that you would never want anything bad to happen to them, right? Well, if you lived in the medieval ages, you might beg to differ because while today we see hedgehogs as these lovable little creatures, back then they were nothing but something to feed your family for dinner. Sorry to anyone who owns a hedgehog. Yeah, hedgehogs were a delicacy back then and there's even a record of a common recipe for them. In the olden days when someone was looking to cook up a hedgehog for dinner, you would first have to unalive it and then gut it, tie it up, and wrap it in pastry. Apparently, if your hedgehog wouldn't unroll after it was uh, taken out, so to speak, you would just have to simply boil it in water and continue the preparation process. Apparently, back then, it was believed that eating hedgehogs helped with medical conditions like throat inflammation and leprosy. Not really sure how effective that was, but it was still a thing. At number nine, porpoise pottage. During Lent, people weren't allowed to eat meat. Normally, people would substitute to do fish into their diet during this time, but if you were one of the wealthy, then you could treat yourself to something a little more extravagant than just plain old fish. For those who could afford it, they would sit down to a seafood feast, and they really ate anything that came out of the sea. We're talking fish, lobster, crabs, eels, and dolphins. Yeah, they thought that dolphins were fish and so safe to eat during Lent. In a recipe book from 1399 written by King Richard II's cooks, there was a recipe for porpoise fermentry, which was basically a sweet and spicy wheat porridge with dolphin on top. It consisted of almond milk and saffron and just sounds absolutely vile. I couldn't imagine what a dolphin would even taste like, but I wouldn't imagine that it would taste very good, especially with almond milk, wheat, and saffron. But would you guys try it? Now before I carry on telling you guys about the weird things that people ate in medieval times, I would first like to take a moment to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. And number eight, garbage. Ever heard of a garbage plate? It's a dish that originated in Rochester, New York, and it is a big plate of things like macaroni salad, baked beans, french fries, and a bunch of other things. Well, in medieval times, they also sort of had their own garbage plate, but unfortunately, it doesn't sound nearly as good as the one from Rochester. Their garbage was pretty foul, and honestly, I don't think that you could pay me enough to sit down and eat this thing. As the name dictates, garbage was made of, well, garbage. Anything that wasn't used in other dishes was basically thrown into a pot, cooked up with some seasonings, hopes, and dreams. Even the recipe sounds gross, dude. In an excerpt from a medieval cookbook to prepare garbage, it says to quote, take good giblets, aka the garbage, chicken heads, feet, livers, gizzards, and wash them all clean. Throw them into a nice pot and add fresh beef broth, powdered pepper, cinnamon, cloves, mace, parsley, and sage chopped small. Then take bread, steep it in the same broth, draw it through a strainer, add and let it boil till done. Add powdered ginger, verjuice, which was sour grape or apple juice, salt, and a little saffron, and serve it forth." End quote. Yeah, I think I'm gonna pass on that one, thank you. At number seven, cock and trice. When living in medieval times, people had to be very creative when it came to cooking. You had to create flavors with limited resources while also trying to dodge the risk of poisoning people if you're not careful, but this next dish pushed the boundaries of culinary art so much that Gordon Ramsay would have to call every chef who made this an idiot sandwich. Back in medieval times, some chefs would prepare a dish called cock and rice, and it was kind of a monstrosity. This imaginative dish was made by combining a pig and a chicken into some kind of revolutionary Frankenstein's monster. Essentially, this dish was made by cooking a pig and a chicken, and then the chef would cut both animals in half and then attach the front half of a pig to the rear half of a chicken. Then it would be stuffed and roasted on a spit, glazed in egg yolks and saffron, and topped with a gold leaf before being served to an elite like a king or queen. There was also an alternative version of this dish where instead of having the two halves of the animal mashed together, it would instead have the chicken riding the pig, and some chefs would even adorn the chicken with a knight's helmet for some extra pizzazz. Not sure why this was invented, but it certainly is creative to say the least. At number six, 
roasted cat. We started off this list talking about one common household pet that was traditionally eaten in medieval times, but now we have another, so for anyone who has a feline friend, you might want to skip this part. Roasted cat was yet another bizarre food that was eaten back in the olden days, and I can't really say I'm all that surprised. I mean, they were eating hedgehogs, dolphins, and garbage, so I wouldn't put it past them to take a bite out of Garfield too. Roasted cat was a pretty straightforward dish. They would just marinate it and roast it like they would any other kind of animal, but what makes this dish strange other than the fact that it's a cat was the way that it was prepared and the superstition behind it. Cats already have a lot of superstition behind them so it makes sense that in medieval times they believed all sorts of things about felines but when it came to cooking them it was believed that cutting the head off before cooking it was a vital step because quote it is not for eating for they say that eating the brains will cause him who eats them to lose his senses and judgment. End quote. So yeah don't go eating cat brains I guess. Number five helmeted chicken. Why the clock back 10 years ago? I was but a humble freshman in high school. I was green behind the ears. I didn't know what to expect. Sure, people had prepped me for the worst, but I just didn't know what to expect. I got even more nervous when I saw the pretty girls showing up. Gosh, they were so pretty. <sighs> Someone be my girlfriend? But I relaxed. I knew I was okay because at lunchtime, I was going to watch my favorite YouTube channel, Epic Meal Time. Besides this one, it's a good channel. You should check it out. They made combinations of food that I didn't even think were possible. I was absorbed into their culture, and who wasn't? Why do I bring the awkward time of 2012 back up? Well, that's because the medieval times had their own version of a turducken. Sort of. While it's not a chicken inside a duck inside a turkey inside a pig covered in bacon like EMT did, it's similar and perhaps off putting for our veggie fans. Basically, there was a chicken sewn to a pig to look like a knight riding on a horse. And yes, I'm sure the chef washed his hands. Right? Number four, going to the schedule delifing. Entertainment wasn't as accessible or the same as it is now. In modern times, we pull up our phones, turn on our laptops, sit in front of the TV, and there is all the entertainment we need from battles to baby drama. But back in the Middle Ages, there wasn't much to do after you were done your work for the day. There were forms of entertainment music, theater, games, sports, etc. But a favorite would have to be going to see the latest ne'er do well lose their head. Public shows of punishment were not just something you went to see when you were bored. Actually, their more important purpose was as a deterrent for anyone who thought of maybe committing a crime. And yeah, that would do the trick. It was also a good way to finalize the trial of a criminal for all those who were affected or who were part of the village. Eventually, they became more of a private affair, but not entirely, with the last public de-lifing in the United States happening in 1936. Let's not bring this one back. No, I'm good. I'll pass. Number three, witch trials. Speaking of scheduled de-lifing, witch trials, or rather, uh, get rid of anyone who's been deemed a witch, which, in case you didn't know, was uh, as simple as this. Right then, the young woman down the lane is smarting at her boys in the school. Right then, folks, pitchforks and torches it is. Unfortunately, for a lot of women at the time, it was tough. When has it not been, right ladies? While some men were declared witches too, this was a tool really for people with power to get rid of those who dare oppose them. There's too many royals to mention who took part in this, however, one stands out as bloody Queen Mary. Names like this were not given for no reason. She was known for sending witches and heretics alike to the stake to be cooked. Number two, outlaw. In movies and TV, characters named as outlaws, specifically in the Wild West sense, are seen as cool guys, outsiders, and wanderers with an air of mystery and possibly power. Trust me when I say it was not what she wanted to be, especially in the medieval times. If you were declared an outlaw in the Middle Ages, you lost all rights, possessions, and any kind of protection being part of society would give you, including people getting in trouble for ending your stay on this plane of existence. You are forced to fend for yourself with nothing to your name, and in a world rife with disease, wars, bandits, and very little readily available food or water, things get harsh quick. If you didn't have a buddy to turn to for help, who you knew for a fact would not literally stab you in the back, then you were pretty screwed. Luckily, I have Andrew. Right? Yeah! Number one, ladies. Okay, so let's say you're married. Husband tends the crops. You as the wife take care of the home. This isn't a statement about the patriarchy. I'm just saying taking care of the home is just as important back then. Seriously, it is. Well, your husband comes in from tending the fields one night with a fever. Uh-oh, he's fallen ill. And 
now he's perished. Now you're left alone with no income and a society that's probably not okay with you working. So that means it's time to pull up your pants. Well, actually, pull them down, as in a scenario like this, it would be time to work that street corner, and a lot of women did do that. The same way Adam works on building Legos in his dungeon. A joke. But as they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, and folks, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Tradition or not. Yeah.